And again, if I go through these names and somebody gets missed that's filled out a card, please raise your hand at the end. So first we're going to have Nancy Kirby, and then we're going to have Sandra Sullivan. If you just state your name and address or name and city when you come up. I offered to take the little one for a little while. We could just pass them back and forth. <laughs> Oh, okay, so now I'm nervous now that I'm up here now finally. Don't be nervous. Um, okay, so I came up here to talk about the biosolids as we've been here Nate, all day now. can you now. give us your name? Uh, and Nancy Kirby. I am a resident of Melbourne. Um, I live off of John Rhodes. We are in the middle of the 95 exit being built, about two feet away from our gate. We are half a mile away from, at the end of Egali, the um, Lake Washington. And in July, it's not a matter of when people are going to get sick. It's a matter of when they are going to start all coming together and saying we are sick. Um, our water was, we got positive coliform tests in my home, in several homes in my community. Um, I had an upper respiratory infection for over three weeks. My kids were all sick. They all were on nebulizer treatments. The, our water smelled like mold. I was bathing the baby, I had him in a bathtub, and I'm looking around, I have twin little boys, and I'm looking around, and I'm like, maybe they left a towel somewhere to realize that it was the water that I was bathing him in. It's the water that we were drinking, and my entire house was sick. So I'm just coming here today to please ask you guys to really think about this biosolid ban. I'm happy to hear that a lot of you are on board with it, um, because it really is not a matter of you know, if people are going to get sick, it's that they are getting sick. And I get messages all day long from people that live in this community, what they're coughing up, pictures. I mean, it's, it's, off, it's honestly just awful. But I never want anyone else's children to go through what I watch my kids go through getting sick and the nebulizer treatments. And I'm just really asking you guys to just really think long and hard just as a mom of what we are really leaving to our children and these biosolids of just years and years of contamination. And it's just really, really scary to watch your kids all get sick from, from where you live and there's nothing you can do. We were fortunate enough to be able to spend $10,000 on a water system in our house to make it better. And poof, my kids were all better. I got over my upper respiratory infection. He still has a lingering cough, which I'm sure you've all heard in here. But it's really scary to watch, and not every resident in this county has $10,000 to invest in reverse osmosis systems and water filtration systems for their whole home. So we were lucky enough to be able to. However, this is something that is going to be a long-term effect. This isn't just something that's over now because they decided to put chlorine in the water and wash chemicals with chemicals, which is basically what's being done right now. So I really just came here as a mom to just ask you guys to really think about what we're leaving our kids in the long term. <clears throat> Politics aside, you know, it's really a generation thing of him going to continue to be crazy, <laughs> but wanting to keep them all here and keep them safe. So that was really all I came here for and waited all day. So thank you for listening to me and I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Nancy. Sandra? And after Sandra Sullivan, Stell Bailey? Sandra Sullivan, South Patrick Shores. I was just a mom. My, you know, I was in my zen. I liked my gardening. I was in my bubble. And I was not active in any way, government wise. And now, you know, you see me here at each meeting. Why? Because when our health starts getting impacted by different issues, so I'm glad that this came up. Um, I also had pneumonia-like symptoms that went away as soon as I switched to bottled water. And I have no doubt that we were impacted by the toxins. And um, but, So the biosolids is just one thing that is, um, is impacting the, um, the, the river. And, um, you know, I've looked at the reports from the St. John's Water Management District. Um, I, I think it's exceedingly important that we need monitoring being put on, and that's going to take you guys advocating to the various agencies 
um, and get the, the either the state or St. John's Management District to put those either the Kilroy's or the FAU system on there. They can predict algae blooms. They can track how much algae bloom real time because the problem is, is there's a delay. It's up to three weeks until they know that there's algae toxins in the water and then they start treating it after so we're exposed for up to three weeks. These algae blooms aren't going away. The impact of the biosolids being close to the river, the, the guidelines right now or the rules right now is it's 100 feet away from the river. That's not very far for the runoff to go in and we're talking, um, we're talking uh, that um, it's not only nutrient loadings, but carcinogens, heavy metals, contaminants, pharmaceuticals, and, and the pathogens, including hepatitis A. So I know you guys are all up on this, um, but I would take, ask you guys to go a step further, even to the, the biosolids, and that is protecting the St. John's River. I mean, we're looking at um, sea level rise. We're looking at stronger hurricanes. We saw after Irma, that was three feet underwater. So how long were those biosolids sitting underwater leaching into the river, which is our drinking water source? So the, those whole floodplains, I mean, the idea of developing that right now, I, I was just floored that, that, that you're looking at developing on floodplains, which are going to be, as, especially as sea level rise comes up, um, going to impact this county more and more. And then the last thing I would just say is, again, using our civics of the multiple level of the government, is look at the idea of protecting the St. John's and working with your state legislators and federal legislators to get grant money, use the grant money to buy up lands and turn it into something like the Everglades Park. Turn it into a big natural resource that people come and fish and, and where it's preserved because this is our drinking water. Thank you. Thank you. Still, and after Stell Bailey, we have Linda Yuba. Good afternoon, Stell Bailey, Cocoa, Florida. For at least five years, South Florida sewer plants have been exporting their sewage remnants to Bavard County. An example is the Port St. John site that has over 232,000 pounds applied. It is less than four miles from the Indian River Lagoon near an elementary school, high school, and community church. The field where this is applied drains into a canal and leads to the St. John's River. Every summer we have a ban on fertilizer with nitrogen and phosph phosphorus, nutrients that can feed harmful algae blooms, which is supposed to help the Indian River Lagoon. However, the DEP allows landowners to dump Class B waste as fertilizer. Either we really want to protect the Indian River Lagoon for, from excessive nitrogen and phosphorus, or we just want it to appear as though we are protecting the lagoon. Sludge contains highly varied amount of organic chemicals, toxic metals, chemical irritants, and pathogens. There is an unknown amount of harmful toxins in these biosolids, including carcinogenic chemicals such as PFOS, in which the state of Florida does not have an enforceable health limit set. PFAS are a significant concern due to their extensive presence and persistence in the environment. PFAS exposure can cause suppressed immune function, lower vaccine effectiveness, greater risk of autoimmune diseases and cancer. PFAS present in large concentrations in sludge makes it possible for them to enter human and ecological food chains from biosolids amended soil. A 2002 study by the University of Georgia found higher reports of ill health symptoms and diseases near biosolids permitted fields. Just because there is a compliance with the regulations does not ensure pr protection of public health. Even though Class B biosolids require specific pathogen reduction, it is not based on the risk assessment and Class B still contains significant levels of pathogens. We are taking things that other counties ban. Brevard County is not an outhouse. Spreading sludge risks decades of expensive environmental restoration to improve the river's water quality. Dredged sludge should be tested for contaminants and for nutrient loading before being spread anywhere. Those analytical results should be made public prior to spreading. If contamination is found or the sludge possesses threat to nutrient levels in the watershed area, the sludge should be sent to an appropriate facility for treatment and disposal. Today, I ask that you support the ban on biosolids for better, to pr better protect our health of communities and waterways. Thank you. Thank you so much. Linda. After Linda Huba, Paul Alfrey. Good 
Linda Huba, Indian Harbor. If Floridians have to drink bottled water and our recreational bodies of water become biohazards, we're not going to want to live here anymore and neither is anyone else. The problem of biosolids, sewage, blue-green algae, other algae, red, brown, is not going away and it's not going to get better anytime soon either. That's according to a lecture I attended last week by <clears throat> Blue-Green Algae Task Force member, Dr. Jim Sullivan, PhD, which was entitled, Harmful Algal Blooms and Human Health Threats. That was as grim as it sounds. Um, there were over 200 people in attendance. I don't know if any of you were able to attend, but I wanna share with you a phrase that stuck in my head uh, after I left the presentation. And that phrase is, liver dissolving toxins, which are released by blue-green algae, and it's what killed those three dogs in the pond in North Carolina. And Dr. Sullivan said dogs are a sentinel species. They're like the canary in the coal mine. So, ban biosolid applications, but wherever it goes, um, if we just move it to other places in Florida, it winds up in runoff, it winds up in the aquifer, it winds up in our water. So the big picture, uh, Florida has to ban biosolid land applications statewide and invest in technology solutions that scientists and environmentalists agree work. And Brevard and the state of Florida have to continue to deal with the 50 plus years of growth and water mismanagement which has left us with tons of seagrass killing legacy muck. Common sense tells me that my interest in cleaner water might not perfectly align with the interests of influential industries that love growth but hate regulations and fees. So on this issue, scientists and environmentalists have to prevail and we all need to keep educating ourselves. Um, what do the Harbor Oceanographic Institute scientists think? What do the Thousand Friends of Florida have to say? Uh, where does the Sierra Club stand? I wanted to thank you, Commissioner Pritchett, for emceeing Straight Talk on the Lagoon uh, at Dixie Crossroads. I wasn't there in person, but I watched it uh, on the Save Our Indian River Lagoon Coalition website or Facebook page, I don't know but I watched the presentation, I watched the Q and A's, and it really did, it was informative and I learned a lot, I recommend it. Uh, there's also the Clean Water Coalition of Indian River Lagoon. Uh, the truth is out there, we need science-based, environmentally approved solutions. Well, could I say one more thing? I have to cut you off, to be okay. fair, I'm sorry. That's okay. After Paul Elfrey, Douglas Spar, Spar. Good afternoon to Bobard County Commission. I want to start by saying thank you to each Paul, one of you for your, you oh, Paul your, Alfrey from Melbourne. I should know this by now, you would think, right? And just for the public, he's a, also a councilman. Councilman uh, District 5, City of Melbourne. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Bobard County Commission. I want to start uh, by thanking each one of you for your service. Until you've been behind the dais and made tough decisions, you can't appreciate uh, the sacrifices each and every one of you make. I'm, here, I'm not here today as a chemist or as a doctor or an environmental expert. You know, I didn't stay at the Holiday Inn Express last night. <laughs> but I am coming to you as someone who grew up here and has seen the negative changes and impacts uh, that Bavard faces now. Um, I am also now someone who gets calls on a regular basis, and more now than ever, uh, when they, their water doesn't taste or smell right. And with our city providing water for about 57,000 accounts in eight cities and part of the unincorporated Brevard, uh, I've been receiving many calls, I'm sure, as all of you have. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, over 30 years ago, uh, when I attended O'Galley High School, the cool kids used to go out to Lake Washington and go swimming and airboating. I wasn't one of those cool kids, but I did tag along occasionally. Uh, Lake Washington had a sandy bottom, uh, and it was in a much better place in a better state. Um, I thought the cool kids who would swim were crazy because of the, you know, the Florida Gators, but we won't go there. Um, 
But uh, I am sure these kids aren't crazy enough now to swim in the same Lake Washington they did 30 years ago. Fast forward to 2019 and I have a responsibility to my residents to provide clean water. And as you know, the city of Melbourne is one of the few water providers that uses some surface water for processing. Our staff insists we can provide quality water by treating with more chemicals during a balloon. The definition of insanity is using more chemicals to treat water we consume because the water source is damaged by the overloading of chemicals we put near the water source. Many local governments have banned the biosolid spreading and now we are dumping uh, the dumping ground for South Florida and some of the other speakers said that eloquently. And it's getting harder to ignore the reality that nitrogen, phosphorus uh, is present in, tre in, in treated sewage sludge and it is finding its way into our waterways and feeding algae blooms. On a lighter note, I received a call this morning from State Representative Randy Fine who supports this ban. He apologizes, apologizes he couldn't be here, but he's on a tour learning about UCF. Uh, also, Representative Fine admitted that he needs to stay more in his lane, and he supports this board's decision uh, it, to ban biosolids. Also, each member of our delegation, each and every one of you I see at events, are our leaders, and you're big supporters of the lagoon and clean water. And I ask today that you continue to be that leader. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> Douglas Spar, and after Douglas, Courtney Barker. Uh, Douglas Spar, uh, 825 Clifton Cove Court, uh, Coco. I'm here today to advocate for a total moratorium on biosolid spreading for an interim period while advanced technology solutions for biosolids are explored. I've heard some suggestion that uh, the moratorium may just be a limit on new permits. But the two biggest spreaders in the upper basin are the Deseret Ranch and Deer Park Ranch. I've handed you maps of their permitted fields in Brevard. Also a map of Deseret spread fields that surround Taylor Creek Reservoir, where Cocoa Water Utility gets about 30% of the supply. <clears throat> I, don't have a, I don't have a breakout uh, by county, but according to DEP, in 2017, Deseret spread over 49,000 dry tons in Deer Park spread close to 9,000 tons. Both ranches also have extensive spread permits in Orange and Osceola counties. The fact that there are significant spread fields in upper basins of Indian River County, Osceola, Orange, and Vars suggests that ultimately the state will need to get involved. I have provided a graphic from the district that shows the exponentially increasing biosolids application in the upper basin since 1998. I attended the Regional Biosolid Symposium that presented by the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council in the summer of 18. At the symposium, several enterprises presented advanced technology solutions for processing biosolids. These enterprises all have pilot projects up and running. And also attended the um, DEP's Biosolid Tech Advisory Committee meetings. And advanced technology solutions got short shrift there. Takeaway message was that the uh, wastewater community has a lot of inertia. They spend a lot of money on what they got, and they're not really interested in changing anything. So given the inertia in Florida's wastewater processing community, there's not going to be any progress towards advanced technologies until the state intercedes. No municipal, county, or regional wastewater utility wants to be the first to stick their toe in the water and risk taxpayer money on advanced technology venture. The state will need to take the lead on this by coordinating and funding some larger scale technology demonstrations. I recommend the Brevard advocate for an advanced technology demonstration at the Adamson Road uh, landfill. So the, the reality is the population increasing, more toilet flushing, more wastewater to process, more residuals dispose of, toxic housing blooms are increasing in frequency and severity, and a fact that is placing the handwriting on the wall for land spreading. The time for advanced technology solutions at hand. In a few seconds remaining, the European Union is way ahead of the uh, this country on that. The advanced, because uh, like Germany, uh, by 2029, everybody has to have a plant to get the phosphorus out. If Germany can do it, Florida should be able to, too. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. And tell Mary we said hi. Yeah, good. Hi, Mary. Uh, after Courtney Barker, Al Alexis Miller. Hi, Courtney Barker, City Manager for the City of Satellite Beach. 
Um, great to spend the whole day with you guys again. <laughs> I appreciate it. And it's really been the whole day. Should be used um, to this. Yes. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you all for um, for taking this issue up. I think this is great. I really appreciate your support on the ban. Um, I do think that the ban needs to include current property owners that are accepting the biosolids. So um, if we do no grandfathering, that might not get the results that we're hoping to get. Um, but if you are unable to do that, you know, I think um, Virginia has some, a lot of good ideas on how to mitigate um, that possibility if you couldn't do the grandfathering. So um, I don't want to take up your time today because I think you're going the direction we want you to go. But I also thought that, you know, we have the opportunity or really it, it would be better in the long run to address biosolids at the source. And there's a lot of technologies out there, new technologies that are, that enable utilities to process the end result, which is, you know, the, the, um, cleaned out crap, I guess you, <laughs> you called it earlier, um, but to process it better and to make it into usable products like biofuel or something like that. And since you have the land at the landfill, um, you know, that might be an opportunity to partner with the state and become leaders in Brevard County or be in the state, really, um, to look at a pilot project. And I think Virginia has talked about that in the past. And um, pursuing that as a legislative priority is a great idea that would be you know, basically taking care of it at the source. We're never going to stop producing biosolids. You know, we have the, the tremendous growth in this state, you know, unless we put barricades at I-95 and I-75 and tell people to stop having children, we're going to still grow. And so we need to think of better ways to address it at the source. And so I think you have that opportunity to do that. So I appreciate what you're doing today. You guys are really doing a great job, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Alexis? And after Alexis, Matt Fleming. Hi, my name is Hi. Alexis Miller. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm a project manager over at the city of Satellite Beach. And um, I just wanted to say thank you for the time today in discussing biosolids. Um, a lot of this discussion so far has pretty thoroughly covered concerns regarding the application of biosolids in our county. And I can appreciate um, the commission considerations for legitimate strategies to address a pretty complex problem. Uh, moving towards a moratorium is definitely an initial step in the right direction and shows initiative on the part of you and your staff to both prioritize our region's water supply as well as quality of life in our county. Looking ahead, identifying, facilitating, and incentivizing processes that will repurpose biosolids, as Courtney mentioned, at the source, like biofuel facilities, are complex and forward-thinking strategies for our region. This is not an issue that will ever go away in our developing and growing state, and as such, how we handle it now directly impacts the quality of life and water in the future of our state. Make this a priority now so that it does not become a crisis later. As a recently graduated student and young professional, I hope to see the county continue to address this issue proactively and with resiliency in mind. As a public servant, I have the responsibility to protect a happy and healthy environment for the residents of this region, as well as to communicate support to you, the commission, for what is an important mechanism in protecting our region's health and happiness. Given the task at hand, I hope my responsibility as an employee of Satellite Beach will soon encompass partnering with the county and the state to address biosolids at the source in a resilient and proactive way. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Matt Fleming. And after Matt, Lou Kotnick. If Lou is here, I'm Sam. I'm Sam. My name is Matt Fleming from Satellite Beach. Uh, biosolids are not just toxic human waste. They include toxic muck deposits from the river from the muck dredging. Uh, banning biosolids, it, what we're doing right now is spending tax money uh, to give to dump truck companies and farmers to spread toxic human waste on their farmland. That floods every summer and flows into the St. John's, which is our drinking water. The ban will be unenforceable. The implied preemption exists because the state legislature has expressed its intent for the state to be the sole regulator of this activity. If the county does try to enforce this ban, they will be putting taxpayers on the hook for massive legal fees. All six of Brevard's legislators voted to take away localities' ability to ban the spreading of layers of toxic human feces on farmlands that flow into drinking water. Let me repeat that. All six of Brevard legislators voted for this. They voted to take away the county's ability to actually do something about this. And one of those legislators 
wrote that amendment that did that, and another one of the legislators has us here today participating in what ultimately is kind of just a show. So Virginia Barker has opposed banning this. She says long-term goal is to work with ranchers, not to inflict heavy-handed local regulation. I support a ban as a symbolic gesture. I think it sends a message to the DEP that they need to do something about this to end the practice completely and protect the St. John's River Basin and our lagoon. Um, I have several questions. Why was this practice allowed in our county in the first place? How much money are haulers and farmers making from poisoning our drinking water and destroying the St. John's River? And why didn't the county issue a public statement against HB 829, which took away local control of biosolids, or at least put it at risk to, to give credence to the argument that you might still be able to ban it? Uh, there's an answer for that. Our old county is run by Republicans. They've been doing this forever. It's been like that for a really long time. It's not going to change all of a sudden. This, it's a sham. So the lagoon is dead. There's dirt on our beaches, and there's toxic algae in our drinking water. Uh, it's time for people to recognize that and, and seek real change. Thank you. I didn't see Lou Kotnick here. Vince Lamb? Did you see your daughter here earlier? Yeah, that's really a first. And I've never uh, followed my daughter on the podium, uh, probably anywhere, and certainly not here. And she's, <laughs> and she's just like you. She's lovely. <laughs> anyway. Go ahead. Uh, I've been uh, shortening my, my, my notes uh, quickly because, you know, several of you have expressed a sentiment of uh, supporting this anyway, so I don't want to dwell on that. Name location real fast. Oh, yeah, Vince Lamb, Merritt Island. Excuse me. I, 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 I'm here representing both St. John's Riverkeeper that I had the, I'm the, I organized the Headwaters Advisory Group of the St. John's Riverkeeper, and I'm also uh, a member of the board of the uh, Brevard Indian River Lagoon uh, Coalition. Lou Contic was going to speak uh, on, beh on behalf of the uh, Indian River Lagoon Coalition, but it went, uh, the meeting went too long and we lost him. I, I've been involved in this issue for about 18 months, and it was when we first learned about the pollution coming from the Presley Ranch on the way to Blue Cypress Lake. Blue Cypress Lake was one of the was long, uh, the most pristine lake in the chain of lakes that make up the St. John's. Uh, it's the uh, most important rookery in the world for nesting ospreys with over 300 nests there. That's been kind of ruined that the, uh, the Presley Ranch agreed to take Class B biosolids in pretty large volumes. Uh, and basically, they're, they're stored on the lands. They may be used for fertilizer to some extent, but I've seen pictures of, uh, of you know, just piles of the stuff. So, and this is like, uh, you know, 200 yards, 300 yards away from Blue Cypress Lake. I've come to realize that biosolids are kind of like muck that, uh, that, you know, first of all, we didn't know muck was a problem until we accumulated uh, two or three hundred million dollars worth of it or something. And uh, these biosolids are sitting on these properties now and, uh, you know, whether they were applied as fertilizer or they're just being held, but they're going to represent a problem to the, uh, to the St. John's and perhaps to the Indian River Lagoon. But may, in Brevard County, we're kind of buffered uh, and it's mostly biosolids are a St. John's issue more than a lagoon issue. But they're, they're, it's, it's a lot similar to muck in terms that it, uh, it's an accumulation of pollutants over a long period of time, and they're not going to go away by themselves. I think it, require, it clearly requires a state solution that, uh, you know, banning the application in, in Brevard County, whether it can be enforced or not, is sending a message to our legislators that we don't want uh, the South Florida uh, concentrated human waste here. Uh, and, you know, so, uh, you know, it, but the big thing is the state has got to take the leadership between the DEP and our, and our legislators and our governor. Uh, I think this problem has gotten enough attention. I've, I've met with Senator Mayfield on this, and she's very interested and wants to help. Uh, so Brevard County can't do much by ourselves, but I think it's important that we send this message. So I would uh, encourage you to, uh, to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Vince. Billy Kempfer, and after Billy, Robert Burns.
Billy Kempfer, I reside 8053 Ocean Prairie Lane. I'm a fourth generation. This ranch has been in our family for about 120 years. We've been applying biosolids for about 25 years, between 20 and 25 years. You know, we were concerned before we ever started. We did a lot of research. Since we started, we have over the years done soil tests, water samples, and such as this. And actually after Hurricane Fay, when the water stood on the side of two piles, which the gentleman talked about staying pile forever, legally it can only stay in, in a pile for 30 days before it's gotta be spread. But anyhow, you know, the yuck factor is what the, is the issue with biosolid. But when this, these two piles stayed there for weeks and weeks with water up on them and then gone and up again before they could be spread, and the grass that far away was as green, almost black. I got in touch with NRCS and the county uh, extension office who came out and monitored. And by the time you got 15 feet away, there was no elevated phosphorus in the soil or the tissues. So anyhow, that's kind of when we backed off testing. This all kind of came to a head uh, with the issue on blue cypress, but with the Presley's. Um, you know, what you do in Brevard County, I personally, or our ranch is the only one that's spreading in Brevard County at this point in time, is minuscule to the amount of biosolids that spread in the upper basin. Um, you legally, I mean, the rule that they talked about, the legislature passed, not allowing local governments to pass an ordinance in opposition to an, oper an existing ag, ag operation, uh, you can still ban. I mean, you're legal to do, I think, under home rule. But the data that Virginia was using came from Dr. O'Connor. I mean, excuse me, came from the Water Management District, which at the TAC meeting, Dr. O'Connor, a uh, retired soil scientist from the University of Florida, he debunked that, that, uh, that report. Um, now, as far as what we can put out on chemical fertilizer or phosphorus, you know, we're regulated by by our best, best management practices guideline that we have to have to do a tissue test and have to uh, have to do a soil test. But in this latest revision of the BMP manual, we were discussing phosphorus and how much phosphorus could be allowed and how to determine phosphorus. Dr. De Silva with the University of Florida, uh, then she you know they said something about biosolids and she said, oh no, it says. Biosolids is not like regular phosphorus. Once you apply it, it doesn't go anywhere. So anyhow, I think this is more of an emotional situation. Um, you know, I talked to the district people when they made a different presentation, a watered down version to the Ag Advisory Committee for St. John's, and I offered to allow monitoring I'm sorry, I have to cut you off. I offered them to do monitoring on our property. They said there's no need. So a lot of times we don't okay. even find it where we're monitoring down south. Robert but Burns, and after Robert Burns, Sharon Stewart. I think we both have questions for him. Okay, I thought we were waiting until the end of comments to okay. question yeah, anybody. Really, the people speaking, it's up to you. I don't That's only because once we start down that path, we're okay. questioning everybody, okay. and I. Yeah. I'll be so glad just stay to close. answer any questions that you have. Stay Thank close you, if you could, because. Oh, I'm sorry. You stay close if you could, because I have two more cards, and then we'll call you back up if you don't mind, sir. So Robert Burns and then Sharon Stewart. Good afternoon, Robert Burns, Vieira. Please keep an eye on my daughter. I can't see her with my back turned. Make sure she behaves. I'm just kidding. She's, she's behaved. She just waved. She did? Okay, good. Good girl. If All you right. want to have her come up, she'd come up. You want to come up? She's, yeah, she's at she's, us. Time? She's adorable. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I tell everybody my kids got their, they get their good looks from their mom because I still got mine. <laughs> anyway, um, forgot what I was about to say. What were we talking about? Biosolids. Um, the last legislative session, I think there were four bills on the floor uh, to try to ban biosolids in some way or another, uh, but none of those bills made it to the floor. Um, I think Senator Mayfield was actually presented one. We also had one from uh, representative down in Vero um, trying to do the same thing. Uh, Indian River County actually has a moratorium and they issued an opinion to the Florida Association of Counties uh, about House Bill 829. I just want to read it to make sure I get it correctly. It says Indian River County adopted a moratorium ordinance on the land application of Class B biosolids 
in response to an algae bloom that was exploded, that exploded in Blue Crystal Lake, a class one water body and headwaters of the St. John's River. The destructive biosolids application was actually permitted by FDEP. However, there is an argument that the county moratorium is preempted. While the county took action to protect the, the waters, the state simply sent the issue to be analyzed by the biosolids TAC. Since the proposed state legislation that contained language protecting such a moratorium on the land application of Class B biosolids is likely not to pass this session, as a result, Indian River County is left exposed. And so while they had that moratorium in place, the state representative still um, tried to pass state law to prevent the same thing from happening, specifically in her, in her district, and that did not pass. So I think it's definitely um, some question of to whether or not 829 prohibits us from doing this. So uh, I, I support banning the biosolids, but I also want to look just in case that we cannot, that we find maybe direct staff to find an alternative way to stop this practice in, in this area, whether that be through business licensing or permitting or whatever else uh, the experts in, in those areas may have to give us an alternative to stop this practice if, if we cannot. Um, also, I wanted to ask if our own uh, waste treatment facilities are producing uh, biosolids as a byproduct and what, what are we doing, if we can do anything, to stop our own uh, waste treatment facilities from doing that. Thanks. Thank you. Sharon Stewart. Sharon Stewart, Melbourne Beach, Florida. Uh, thank you for letting me have the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm, I'm in agreement with everyone and with you that banning biosolids, I think, is the right way to go. I also think that uh, we're going to need state funding to stop it at its source, to come up with new technologies and that kind of thing. Um, I also think that Putting anything on the ground ends up in our waterways. That, that includes the muck. That includes any biosolids, whether they're class AA or B or good or bad. It does end up in our water. Um, I have family in Norway, and I, I, I've, been, I've been a resident of Brevard County for close to 50 years. But I've lived in Melbourne Beach for eight years. And when we first moved to Melbourne Beach, we live off the water and off the Indian River Lagoon. And you literally would get scared with the fish jumping. I mean, it was just like constant jumping, clear out of the water. They were everywhere. There were pelicans and herons, and they are all gone. They are all gone. It, you hardly see a fish jump and the diversity is gone. And I just, the, my family doesn't, I don't want them to come and visit. The water stinks, it's, it looks bad. I don't wanna be out on it hardly anymore. I've totally quit eating seafood. Um, just, it's time for us to take on new technologies. It's time for us to stop business as usual. It's time for us to, make some real progress, some real action towards cleaning up our environment. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. All right. Do you have staff questions or do you have Billy Kemp for questions? Kind of both. Okay. Because he's first on the... If, if you want, I mean, however, if you want to go first, I'm Mr. happy to Kemper, refer to you. Why don't you go for it? Do you mind coming back up? You can say no. <laughs> I'll do the best I can. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kemper, and, and uh, appreciate your history here with Brevard County. Uh, my question is, is, assuming we were to ban biosolids, obviously that's a type of uh, nutrients for the, uh, your agricultural uh, uh, product, w what, what would you use in lieu of those biosolids? Chemical fertilizer. Pa Chemical so fertilizer. I mean, that's our only option. Okay. Um, and, and we I are grass farmers. Your grass farms. Um, okay, so help me with chemical fertilizer. Is that rich in nitrogen and phosphorus as well, uh, or is that I, I know nothing. 
Well, it has not been adopted, but according to the latest BMP manual, when it does get adopted. Sorry, say that. The best management practices manual go. for Cal-Calf. Thank you. Um, which those of us that, those landowners, ranchers, farmers that comply with the BMP sign up to be what they call a notice of intent to comply with best management practices are considered to be in compliance. The folks that are that do not, they call it voluntary, but if you don't sign up, then you're required by DEP to monitor all your discharge. Um, we have monitored for years, multiple times, it's found that our discharge water was actually of higher quality than receiving water. But under the new guidelines, we'll be allowed to put down 50 pounds of nitrogen per application. It doesn't say how many you can put down, but 50 pounds per application for grass. Phosphorus is in accordance to a soil test showing a very low phosphorus on the soil test and a tissue test of the, of the forage that you're wanting to apply less than or equal to or less than a 0.015% phosphorus, which for Bahia grass, that happens to be the very critical low number. We argue with that number. Uh, potassium, there is no rule on potassium. Um, most of the time they haven't recommended. They have finally in the last four or five years done more research on potassium and realized that it's much more important than they thought it was for crop production. Years ago when we grew watermelons, the recommended rate for watermelons was 120 pounds of nitrogen, 180 pounds of phosphorus, and 180 pounds of potassium per acre. Now, that's, that's very expensive. That's per application, correct? Per, per acre for the crop, okay. which is for watermelons is like a 100-day crop. Thank you. Can can I then direct that to Ms. Barker? Can you boil that down? Um, I understand that you know Mr. Kempfer would s switch to chemical when when you. I, I'm not sure the the nitrogen and the phosphorus is ke chemical fertilizer markably uh, lower compared to the biosolids. There's a full suite of of. Um, fertilizer blends out there but biosolids is on average 14% um, uh, dissolved phosphorus that will move through the groundwater quickly chemical fertilizers tend to have a higher percent of phosphorus in the form of you know dissolved phosphate that will move through the groundwater quickly Okay, so put that in. Put that into my uh, eighth grade biology. Um, chemical phosphorus is wor uh, Sorry, chemical f for if I'm concerned about the drinking water, which I think we all are, and Mr. We ban biosolids, and Mr. Kempfer goes from biosolids to chemical fertilizer, which I imagine is much more expensive. Um, would that be better, or would that be worse for the the drinking water? It depends on how much he places. So if you put the same amount of biosolids phosphorus and chemical fertilizer phosphorus, you would probably have more runoff from the chemical fertilizer phosphorus. But the problem with biosolids is that in order to get enough nitrogen for your crops, you're putting too much phosphorus. And so, you know, it depends on the crop, it depends on the use, it depends on, you know, a lot of factors, but it's, it's not a clear answer, which is better or worse. So from a... I know this is a this is more a biology question than a uh, than a policy question. If you can't tell me which one is worse, what what is other than the rationale that we need to ban biosolids? What is the rationale behind the the scientific rationale behind banning uh, biosolids? The water management district went through. Um, an analysis of their available data in the St. Johns River, multiple stations where they go and collect data monthly. And they look for trends in that data. In watersheds where biosolids were being placed, they found increasing concentrations of phosphorus over a 20-year time frame. In areas where biosolids were not being placed, they predominantly did not find that increasing trend in phosphorus. So then they tried to look at 
you know, other lines of evidence. And so they looked for can indicators. I, can I stop you there? Yes. I, 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 uh, I'm just trying to make a comparison. I understand that biosolids are worse. It makes sense that biosolids are worse than no fertilizer whatsoever. I think that's well understood. But the question is, is did that research look at one biosolids and one chemical fertilizer and, and make that comparison? Or was it just biosolids versus nothing at all? That research did not look at biosolids versus chemical fertilizer specific to phosphorus. It, is, it, is there, is there, I, I'm just wondering if, uh, you know, I'm not against uh, for so banning. I, I, IFAS, I, the University of Florida correct. has done studies that looked at that. And, and the, I'm sorry, and the results, you know. Give and that's me the, what I was saying. Sorry. That the amount of phosphorus in chemical fertilizers is of a type that is more likely to get into the groundwater and move. Water soluble versus water insoluble. Okay, so, so just, I'm sorry to go over this again. So if we ban it and Mr. Kempfer goes to chemical fertilizer from the information that you just said, it's going to be worse for the groundwater. Is that, is that? I don't know whether it will be better or worse. He will probably place less phosphorus, but the phosphorus that he places will be more likely to run off. Do we have any control um, over the amount of, it sounds like we don't have any control over the amount. No, we do not. So it, it very well could, it very well could be worse. Um, I, I recommend monitoring and he, he you know, Mr. Kempfer has, has volunteered to allow that. Okay, I, I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, understand because I, obviously, Banning biosolid sounds great, but it sounds like the alternative potentially, you know, could be worse. And Mr. Kemper, uh, just about uh, help help me here. Um, I understand biosolids are in an inexpensive uh, form of fertilizer compared to. We feel that we are doing a public service by taking that. It does not cost us anything to take it. We do not get paid anything to take it. The downside is the time that we have to give up a pasture for them to completely spread it and then we have to stay off of it for 30 days to allow the sunlight to kill what pathogens are not killed either by by using uh, a, a high pH by lamp lime stabilized or the anaerobically digested which digested which kills almost all pathogens but to be safe other states don't even require that but to be safe well you have to stay off of it for 30 days to allow now, as far as the, the chemical fertilizer versus the biosolids, the analysis of biosolids is 2% phosphorus, typically around 4 or 5% nitrogen. The rules have been up until now a nitrogen-based application. According to the TAC, the DEP and their new guidelines are going to be a phosphorus-based application depending upon the soil holding capacity of the soil where you're going to spread it. We have spread biosolids long enough that I do not know is we will even be allowed to take any biosolids from this point forward. Here again, as I say, Brevard County banning it, I am the only person I know in the whole South Brevard that is applying. We've put out about 50 acres worth of biosolids. I thought that Virginia might would have a map. I actually sent her, emailed her some maps where our closest discharge point where our pump is, and I just pulled a sample last week and I didn't get the water sample back yet. It's seven tenths of a mile from the river. So it's got that much marsh to go through, which the marshes are supposed to take up. Plus before it gets to there, there's a 600 acre retention pond that this water goes through. Also, we are not allowed by DEP regulations to, which is also another picture that I had that I thought she would have available for the screen. It is in places almost two miles from our boundary that is banned from application because of our, um, because of our uh, location being close to a class one waterway. I don't, I, you know, I don't want to dispute the gentleman that said he saw these piles sitting within just a few feet of, of of Lake Blue Cypress. Um, I question that, but I don't know where the Blue Cypress is considered class one because of its adjacent to the, to the river. 
Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, two more sure. questions. I'm sorry for uh, Ms. Parker. What, what have what Mr. Kempfer uh, implied or stated that he's doing a service for using these biosolids? If if we ban them, uh, let's assume everyone bans biosolids. What 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 eventually would happen to them otherwise? I I would guess they would all go to the landfill. They would go to lined landfills. Okay. If you ban on my place, they're just going to go to all Silver County. Okay. And and if we are to ban, um, it basically. If Sorry, it, that was an important clarification. Thank you. So if we ban the land application of biosolids in Brevard, Osceola still allows the land application in Osceola. In the those those water, the water you know, that watershed in Osceola still drains a significant portion of it to the St. Johns River. Okay. So it would be more distant, but it would still be draining. So it, ba it basically comes down to this question, and as, as a scientist, um, if we were to if we were to ban biosolids, it sounds like Mr. Kempfer's property is the one that uses the the bulk of it, and Mr. Kempfer would switch to chemical fertilizers. Would you expect this year, five years from now, or ten years from now, to have any measurable impact uh, on the lagoon? Not on the lagoon because he's west. Or sorry, of the sorry, John's not River. the long. The uh, sorry, the the I'm so focused on the lagoon. You're the lagoon lady. Uh, on on mm -hmm. drinking water quality, I, I apologize. Um, I, I think the the old rule of thumb was that phosphorus bound to the soils and didn't tend to move. I think now that we've been putting phosphorus on the soils for decades we're seeing that it does move, that eventually you've overloaded the capacity of the soil to bind all that phosphorus and it does, does move. So, um, you know, regardless of the source of the, the phosphorus, if you continue to put more phosphorus on, then you're removing, that you're harvesting with your sod or your cattle or, you know, whatever uh, ag operation is going on out there it's going to build up in the soils and eventually it's going to run off into the But that happens river. either way, whether it comes from biosolids or whether it comes from chem chemical fertilizer, which Mr. Kempfer says he's going to do. Yes. I, I would add that um, uh, Stelt Bailey's comments about the, the other things in biosolids, you might also want to think about the pharmaceuticals and the perfluorinated compounds that, that bioaccumulate in biosolids. Thank you. Commissioner Lober. I'm going I'm to actually pick up right where you left off, and I want to focus on that for a minute. So it's, it's not just the fact that you've got nutrients loading in there, nitrogen and, and phosphorus that we're used to dealing with with respect to the lagoon, but you've got, you've got a total of four different sort of broad categories of potential issues contained within the biosolids. You've got the pharmaceuticals, things like acetaminophen, where our plants that produce biosolids, and we have plants in Brevard County that produce biosolids, we don't treat it at all. We don't try to treat it for that. The process for treating that is not something we have in place in any of our plants. So the pharmaceuticals, quite frankly, are concentrated in that beyond what they would be. As far as pathogens, uh, you know, I, I believe Mr. Kempfer, when he says that they, they leave it out, I guess, for 30 days in sunlight, I, I'm not saying it doesn't kill the, the pathogens, but you, you don't have the concern at all if you don't have them laid out there. And I, I believe you've done everything by the, by the textbook as far as what you're supposed to do. I don't think you're a bad guy in this by any means. But I think that the question is, is what, what the benefit for the county is and the best step for the county. You've obviously got the nutrients, the nitrogen and the phosphorus, and then the chemicals, the perfluorinated compounds like PFOS. My understanding is those bioaccumulate. Um, these are not specifically items that we look to treat in the actual wastewater mm -hmm. treatment process in any of the plants that I'm aware of. I, I know I've toured all of the plants, including the municipal plants, uh, in addition to the, the county plant in my district. I've, I've been to some others. I don't know that I've been to every one in every district. Um, but it's, it's something where, you know, you, you have some good questions in terms of um, whether we'd have more phosphorus or more nitrogen in the end if, if uh, this gentleman were to switch over to, um, to natural fertilizer uh, or synthetic fertilizer not, not being generated out of biosolids. And the answer is, as is, is Ms. Barker alluded to, uh, you've got different mixes available. I don't pretend to have the knowledge this gentleman does in terms of the exact concentrations that are available, but it would make sense from a cost standpoint if you were an agriculture guy 
to buy the ideal mix to grow whatever crops you're growing. So if it's a certain percentage of nitrogen and a certain percentage of phosphorus, you're not going to want to overbuy where your land isn't even able to derive the benefit from that. So I would think from a financial standpoint, you'd buy the ideal nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizer mix so that as little as possible ends up going down into the watershed simply because you're wasting money if, if you buy a higher concentration and it's not taken up by the land. So as, as far as one of the questions that came up before, do we produce them? Yeah, we do produce them. Um, I'll tell you that we pay to put every biosolid that we produce in the line landfill in cocoa. We pay, we pay the, uh, the solid waste in order to take it, 20 bucks a ton. It's, it's dirt cheap, but, you know, and I, I looked at that at first, as I mentioned, it was a mistake on my part to think that, well, maybe we should consider restricting that or raising the cost on that to disincentivize. We even take it from some of the other municipalities around here uh, in the, the line landfill. But the, the question I've got is, we don't even know when it comes to PFOS or some of the contaminants of emerging concern, really what the long-term health impacts are. You know, we hear from folks from South Patrick Shores and other areas that there are different types of chemicals with names and compounds I couldn't even necessarily pronounce that are showing up that now, decades after they've been placed, are causing problems. So I, you know, I would love to do anything within my power to help ag. And if there's something we can do to help you, I'd love to help you. But this is one of those things where I, I don't know that what's in ag's best interest is necessarily tying into what, what's in the county's best interest. And if there's something else, I'll stand right next to you and help you, help you get it supported. But this is one of those where you know, I think we really have to be cautious given that it's, it's more than just the nutrients. The nutrients to me, you know, I, I think that if there's any question as to whether this is beneficial or detrimental, and I, I think that given the other concerns, I think it's overriding. But if, if you've been kind enough to allow natural resources to go and check, we can put this in place for a year. And I'll tell you, if, if this doesn't, if this pushes us in the wrong direction in terms of nitrogen and phosphorus loading, quite frankly, you know, bring it back before us. And as long as there aren't other concerns that override it with the pharmaceuticals, the pathogens, or the chemicals, you know, I'm happy to revisit this in a year. Yeah. But I, I think to, to just say, well, we shouldn't do it because we don't know when there are these other concerns that add on top of it. I don't know that that's the answer. And I, like I said, I, I want to do what's right by the county, and I, I'm not out to cause you a problem. I think you know, folks like you tend to get a, a less credit than you deserve because you didn't sell out years and years ago, and you consider to farm, you continue to farm the land. You know, that's honorable. I think it's about as American a profession as there is. And you know, I don't like doing things that put you in a bad spot. So if this ends up not, not accomplishing the objective, I would say in a year we can revisit it, or six months, you know, some appreciable amount of time so that we can see what's going on. The only thing I can answer is the highest water sample that we have collected thus far is 0.04 for phosphorus. Most of our water samples, the ones we did a year ago, right after the issue first started with blue cypress, were non-detectable. I think they pulled like 10 samples. I actually, the H&H, &H, the applier is the one that, because I said something to him and he said, well, let's pull some samples. The highest sample we pulled was 0.04. Now, under a BMAP for a TMDL, the concern number, the target number is 0.09, which is twice as much as what we have discharged. As I say, and I daily, have- can, TMDL is total maximum? Total maximum daily load. Yeah, just so it is. So anyhow, you're talking but, and the BMAP is a basin management action plan. Now, as far as monitoring for, for any of the pharmaceuticals and such as that, we have not done that. I assumed, and here you go happens when you assume, but I assumed this was all part of DEP regulations. But, because I know the heavy metal side, that's one of the things we are very concerned about and, and make sure that anything that is brought to our land is not real high in, in, in the heavy metals. That is one of the big concerns with the biosolid being spread up north in the commercial, close to the commercial areas. Um, I understand one of the things that you can test for in, uh, <laughs> is your uh, artificial sweeteners. They say they don't ever break That's down. Right. That's one of the things that you can <laughs> determine whether it's coming from effluent of some form, whether it's from septic tanks oh, or from, uh, you know, where package plants are allowing their effluent to allow you know to get into the waterway now you were concerned about the biosolids one of the first things you mentioned was the indian river lagoon nowhere north of the county line can fresh water that does get biosolids get to the lagoon so anything south of there has to come 
has to come from down south. And the Indian River and St. Lucie County have both banned bios solids. Yeah, and just, just my last thought on that topic, and I, I appreciate if we have anyone applying biosolids, I like that it's someone that's knowledgeable that, that apparently, I mean, without any question, has the knowledge, cares about the area. But, you know, my concern isn't your specific application necessarily. It's what happens when the next guy wants to do it and he doesn't have the same level of care that you do. And that's, that's the problem. I mean, it's kind of like gun ownership. I think everyone should be able to own. But if you see something where there's a potential to have a problem, you know, you keep an eye on it. It's not that you restrict it altogether, but this is something where, you know, you've got such a unique set of circumstances that's, that's going on there. That's, that's part of the reason why I said in the beginning when I introduced this, if there was a particular district that wasn't comfortable with this, if they wanted to apply it to the rest, you know, that's the direction we can go in. But this is, it's such a tricky area. I don't want to do anything to hurt your business, but I also want to make sure that we don't allow anyone to do something in a less than responsible way. See, Virginia's proposal to start with was to grandfather those of us that were already doing it and not allow anybody new. And that supposedly is how this all came up. Or at least that's what she came to us with and, uh, and was proposing when she came out and met with us in Deseret. But now see, Deseret, is not applying anywhere in Brevard County. Theirs is all Osceola. Now, one of the tests that you'll see from the St. John's data, the North Wolf Creek was extremely high. They showed it to me. District did say, here's a big problem with biosolids right here. That was not from biosolids. All that phosphorus was chemical phosphorus coming from the tile drainage and pivot fields where Deseret had leased that land to the farmers and had nothing to do with biosolids. There were no biosolids whatsoever in that area. So. Thank you all. I appreciate it, Whatever sir. you decide, I understand. may not like it, but I understand where you're coming from. Thanks, sir. Ms. Barker, if I interrupt you guys for a second. I mean, again, I think Commissioner Tobias kind of prodded you a lot, and you're sort of the, at least the scientific subject matter expert when it comes to this. I, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm a lot like you. I find it difficult to commit without the science because I don't want to cause harm that's my concern. I mean, it's one thing to be able to say, yes, I've banned biosolids, but if I've caused a worse problem, then that's, that's the part that I'm struggling with. However, because of the additives, aside from the uh, phosphorus and nitrogen, that's the part that concerns me too. Is there a way to test like out there at that property? Because if he is the only farmer using it, if he's causing at least potentially less damage with the biosolids, because I'm sure that's the intention of us using them all these years anyway. I mean, you can put them in a landfill, but then you're just filling up your landfill quicker anyway. So, I mean, how is that helpful well, to anybody? Well, they'll break down, too. It break up eventually, you know, but then you're filling your landfill, and then you're expanding your landfill, and then you, then you run the risk of landfill leaches and every, I mean, with other stuff, because you've filled your landfill. That's another story, but I just don't want to cause harm. By, by feeling like we're doing something good, however, if, if Mr. Kempfer and his farm is not the problem, maybe the solution, if we determine that he's not the problem, maybe the solution is to ban them everywhere else or that he tests the biosolids that he's putting on his land. I don't know what the solution is. There's got to be somewhere. Because I, and, and I, I'm sure Mr. Kempfer is a really nice gentleman. I, 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 don't, I could care less if he's got to pay for fertilizer. I just don't want him paying for fertilizer that's causing more damage to the watershed. Right. That, that's completely illogical just so we can say that we've banned biosolids. I mean, that would be a very foolish, foolishly scientific mistake if, if what we do here ends up causing more damage we find out in 10 years. So I, I at least as, as far as I'm concerned, I would, I would want to at least look at what his impact is compared to, you know, and, and I wouldn't be opposed to not doing it anywhere else because we're already not doing it anywhere else. But I don't want to, again, I don't want to cause more damage by banning it where he's using it if he's causing less potential damage, if that makes any sense. The, the Water Management District has called through all the common pharmaceuticals that you would find in biosolids. They've got a list of 30 to 40 of them that they are um, starting to test for downstream of some biosolid application sites uh, in the upper basin of the St. John's. We could certainly coordinate with them and, and coordinate with Mr. I Kemper know that's the number one problem is pharmaceuticals. To look at those and, and the perfluorinated compounds if, if the board wanted. What would you do if this was your decision? 
Can I ask you that? <laughs> Can I ask you that? I mean, could you give me your Virginia Barker opinion? It doesn't mean I'm going to agree with you, but if you if you had a say in this or even an expert opinion, would you feel comfortable banning biosolids with your background or not? So uh, the, the county attorney's office has done a lot of coaching on um, <laughs> Oh, in order on. to adopt a ban, you need a good scientific argument. And, that's and, and so I went through what the St. John's had done and the, the analysis that they had done, the correlations that they had developed to come up with you know, their statements that biosolids based on the currently available data looks like the most likely culprit. Um, and I heard, uh, I went back and I listened to the um, meeting tapes that Mr. Kempfer referred to where uh, Dr. O'Connor and Dr. Uh, De Silva um, um, asked very pointed questions about the St. John's analysis. And so the part of all of that analysis that is the weakest, in, in my opinion, is um, the, the step where they ruled out that the source was chemical fertilizer. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure that the way they did that was uh, a strong enough scientific case for me to be able to say it was definitely biosolids, it wasn't chemical fertilizer. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't know how strong of a scientific base you want for um, you know, your, your proposed um, policy, but I, I would want to answer The unique those situation questions. we're in is that you can have, a, you, can, you can base something on science and say, well, this is the best evidence that I have. But if you're basing your decision on something that could actually cause more harm, that's the irresponsible thing to do, I think. And that's the part, not everything that we decide upon, we can say we're going to do a moratorium on building in Merritt Island. Well, we know if we don't do any more building in Merritt Island, we're not going to risk flooding in, in North Merritt Island. But this is one of those decisions. If we decide to ban biosolids, at least at, from this area, what we could end up doing potentially is causing right. more damage. So, so if, you, if you ban biosolids, then you're protecting the water supply from pharmaceuticals and perfluorinated compounds, but you might be increasing the phosphorus um, leaching which could lead to more blue-green algae toxic blooms. Which so is more dangerous to pharmaceuticals, probably. Uh, you know, I, I mean, uh, it, un unknown. The, yeah. the EPA science, it's undetermined. All right, thank you. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. It's just, it's just tough. Yeah. Commissioner Smith. I've listened buttons. to all this, uh, and it's very interesting. And the, the the back and forth between you, I did that in my brain for the last week, because I thought, you know, if I take, I don't know where there's Billy. I don't know what Billy's application actually does, because we're just going by generalities. We know that biosolids doesn't sound good. We know what biosolids are, so we don't think it's good. And but is that reason enough to to cause the guy a lot of money to go out and buy chemical fertilizer, which then I discovered by talking with Virginia and other people might cause more harm because it has greater loads of nitrogen and phosphorus. So where do we go from there? And then to couple that with the fact that we don't know what the state is going to do. The state could come six months from now and tell us that we can't do anything about it. It's up to them. And what they may decide may not make us happy. So that really puts us in a, in a quandary. So I was talking to Courtney Barker a little earlier, and she gave me an idea. And that is that maybe we should look for a real solution, a real solution that actually would solve a problem and it's not going to happen overnight. It's not something that's just going to happen. You know, we're going to flip a switch and next week we're going to have the problem solved. But I think if we look in a long range attitude um, and attack the problem at the source, which is processing the biosolids better. In other words, I've read articles where they're actually making electricity out of biosolids. And we have that, that 
land out at 192 that has been almost permitted to be a, a landfill. Wouldn't it be great if in 15 or 20 years we could have a, a plant out there that would re reprocess biosolids? So what I'm proposing is maybe we should partner with the state. Maybe we should ask the state if they'd be willing to help fund or, or fund some kind of a, an experimental plant. Maybe it's not even experimental anymore. Maybe there are plants out there that are already doing this. Whether it's economical or not, I don't know. But even if it isn't real economical, look at what we're doing to the, to the atmosphere and the environment. That's got to make it worth our while. So anyway, that's, that's just um, the idea that I've got technologies uh, to process the waste in a manner that doesn't decimate our water bodies and creates a positive uh, product. And we don't have to deal with the pharmaceuticals that are in biosolids leaching into the land. I don't know, that's what my proposal is. I think we should reach out to our state representatives and see if they'd be interested in carrying that issue to the state and see if they can't partner with us on some kind of a processing plant. Commissioner Lober? Well, there, there are a few thoughts I have on that. First, as far as processing being a care to this, if we processed 100% of our biosolids, we'd still have the problem because the ag land will still need to be fertilized. Mm -hmm. And whether they use biosolids or they use fertilizer, it, it's going to be the same issue down the road. I don't think it's a bad idea to explore that, but I think that that issue is separate and doesn't resolve the issue that's before us right now. Uh, I will say just real, real briefly on that, on that topic before I switch gears. I know Dr. Scaringe is working on uh, essentially devices that will convert more or less any organic matter uh, into, um, into a uh, sustainable or a, I shouldn't say sustainable, but a, uh, a useful energy source. Now it's it's not something that necessarily is great from an energy uh, production standpoint, but it does get rid of the, the problem, and it's, it's something where I think there's proof of concept at this point, but beyond that, uh, I don't know that it's anywhere near the, the, at the development level where it would need to be to be scaled up. So I, I don't have a problem looking at that moving down the road, but you know, again, I, I think to, to focus on the, the other issues like the pharmaceuticals, like the, the contaminants of emerging concern, I'm fine going one of two ways with this. I don't want them in D2. That's, that's what I can tell you as far as biosolids for a variety of reasons. And don't if I keep them in your them neighborhood, do you? No, I don't want them any. I mean, I'd prefer not to have them even in D4. You're adjacent to me as well. But if our only issue or our only question is what we're doing with one particular ranch in D5, then maybe the answer is well, there, there are a couple options. One, exclude D5 so that we don't have anyone else coming in and doing this from what we're banning, or alternatively, we could put in a moratorium for a period of six months to a year and then have natural resources coordinate with the state to go and check the levels. And if you want, we could even wait to put that in place so we can check it now and get a before and then get an after and have, have the data brought back before us. So instead of saying, well, we don't really know and it could be this or it could be that, we'll have the data. We're not doing anything that's permanent and we'll be in a better position to, to make a long-term assessment, determine what it is that we want to do. I thought about a moratorium, but I'm not sure that, that it, a moratorium, we can even do that. I don't know if it's legal. Applications. Yeah. What do you think, Eden? Well, because of the preemption issue, it's a question. Um, we, you can uh, see if you get a notice that someone is going to challenge it, and then you have 30 days. Well, the, the other thing is I'm, I'm thinking a short period. and I mean, obviously, in terms of potential plaintiffs, I think there may be one. I'm sorry to call you out, sir. But if it's something where you're comfortable with that, I don't mind working with you and saying instead of a year, we'll make it six months just to give us an opportunity to figure out really what the, the least restrictive uh, means of accomplishing the goal would be. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit more up here first before because we're going to end up talking another two hours. So let's just see, I'm where, sorry, we're, I let's just there. see where we're going at least as far as the thought of the commission goes, and then if there's something that the commission... I didn't understand exactly. No, I understand. I understand. Commissioner Pritchett? Virginia, don't we spread biosolids in Port St. John and MIMS also? We do not. City of Titusville the does. The City of Titusville. So this, this might be the only one we're talking about county, but this is happening in other places, so this isn't just isolated. I get calls all the time from constituents that can't hardly take the smell. So it is already being done in, in other areas. 
here's here's kind of this. I know we're talking about the phosphorus, I care about the lagoon and all that, but let me tell you what, the antibiotics in there, the antibacterial pesticides is causing a big problem. And let me bring this up because I've got grandchildren, the steroids and the hormones that are in this. We have children now developing at 10 and 11 years old where it used to be 13 and 14. We're, we're making a mess out of stuff. So that kind of got my attention. There's a lot of things for that. I think, I hope they took the hormones out of the chicken McNuggets too because that was a problem too. But I, I think this is, a, this is something I, I think that's on the forefront right now, something we gotta change. And, and I think as far as being able to control what goes in the fertilizer, it might cost more, we're gonna pay more for food, but it's worth it to keep our children safe is something we have to look at because then you got the right compounds. Like you said, you would have to maybe just put so much extra phosphorus to get the nitrogen levels where you need it for that. So I, I think it's, it's, I just think it's somewhere we need to go, guys, because this isn't the only place that's spreading biosolids. It's the only almost place. like the lesser of the two evils. I know. And so maybe if you want to, maybe we can start out with a moratorium, moratorium on any new applications so we don't have it coming from the south and we'll gradually move into this. I don't know, but I am still highly supportive of getting rid of biosolids as we move forward because not so much the phosphorus, but all those other items, I, I think we're causing damage to future generations because they didn't have all them hormones 30 and 40 years ago yeah. they're taking now. So. Commissioner Tobias. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Barker, uh, can we measure for, for the, all the numerous pharmaceuticals. I think the moratorium sounded like a, a, a good, fair compromise, um, but w would you be able to let us know that as a, uh, as a measure? Um, I, there are thousands of chemicals out there. They're developing new ones all the time, so that's why I said that St. John's has identified 30 or 40 of what they think are maybe the most reasonable culprits to, to look for. We could definitely monitor those. And, um, and again, I have absolutely no idea. Is six months enough time to give you some discernible uh, idea as to whether or not uh, one is worse than the other? Is that, can you do that in three months? Would that take a year? Do you have any idea how long that um, would take? So monitoring for pharmaceuticals or PFAS is a go in, grab the samples, send it to the lab, you have an answer in you know, a month. Trying to discern whether the phosphorus that's leaching off came from biosolids or came from fertilizer, that, that is n not a question that, that we could answer in a short time frame. It's not a question that St. John's has been able to answer with you know, decades of data because there's, there's no marker on the phosphate that you pull in the sample that tells you whether that phosphate came from biosolids or from commercial fertilizer or from septic tanks or leaky sewers or, you know, other sources. So, follow up, Madam Chair? Yeah. So the only thing we would be able to monitor six months is whether or not there was a uh, decrease in pharmace pharmaceuticals. That would be the only thing you definitively could, could test for, is that that would be the only thing we're looking for? And how long, how long would that take? Because we'd be looking for a decrease. The assumption is that they're there now you said you can get a result a little bit later, but we would have to have time for that to whatever runoff from that. How, how what would be the least? Every time? single one has a different half life, breaks down in sunlight at a different rate. So, you have to I mean, if, you, if you, you provided a time frame, we would test at the beginning, we would test at the end, and we would tell you what changed. I don't know. Uh, uh, six months fair? I, I, don't, I don't know. Is three months fair? I honestly have no I, idea. I don't have. I don't know either. Okay, that's a fair answer, thank you. But is nitrogen and phosphate easier to manage when you're not thinking about the unknowns that are in addition to the biosolids? I mean, in addition, like is, is someone who uses too much nitrogen or phosphorus when they're fertilizing or that runoff easier to manage and easier long-term and project-wise to manage than the unknown metals, pharmaceuticals, you know, because that's not something that's going to be consistent. The devil you know is better than the devil you don't know? That's sort of what I'm saying. That's a nicer way of saying it. But it's late. Commissioner Smith? I would like to call a question. Let's move on. So does someone want to make a motion here? I think there's already a motion. Oh, sorry. Oh. Must have been sleeping then. <laughs> it, was, it was actually at the beginning. <laughs> 
Can I can I just ask one more question? Because since I always wait to ask sure, questions. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> do you do we have an idea of who's using the biosolids in the county, or is it like some people use a little bit of it, or is it you know I know Mr. There, Kempfer's. There are only two active permits. One is Mr. Kempfer's, and the other is um, the city of Titusville's wastewater treatment plant has an active permit to land apply theirs. But don't they also? Uh, bring the, the biosolids, or at least some percentage, to, uh, to the Cocoa Landfill. And my understanding was they were one of the depositors, for want of a better term, at the landfill. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I guess it may be a mixture in that case. Thank you. Okay. Okay, then I call I believe, All right, wait, I believe wait. that's, you know, most of the cities, you know, sometimes some of their biosolids goes to the landfill and some of their biosolids goes to haulers that take it to Thank land you. application. And the location is, could be anywhere. Yeah, the location is unknown. Like at least with Mr. Kempfer's farm. Right. The, I mean, we know where he's putting it. So utilities signs a contract with the hauler. The hauler has contractual relationships with farms. Yeah. yeah. So it could go Pole County, Osceola, it could go I know, I know, like, in some of the discussion, we're focusing on Osceola, but this, there could easily be biosolids generated in Brevard County that could be spread in Polk County. Madam Chair, I'd like to call a question. Okay, Commissioner Pritchett, you've made the motion, correct? Okay, Commissioner Pritchett wants to amend her motion. I, I want to um, amend it to do a ban on any new applications on biosolids it'll stop anything else coming in and then also if we could come back to this discussion in six months we've identified three that use them so that we can reevaluate on whether we need to go ahead and do a, a band on all of them I, I think um, we're getting a lot of good information and as Commissioner Isnardi said I want to make sure we're not causing harm I I'm already thinking it's really pretty nasty yeah from the stuff that I've read but I think six months probably won't hurt that. Come back with the a conversation. But I think the ban on new applications right now, moving forward with anybody new trying to bring them in, I think that's just a smart move right now. May, may I just ask? Maybe with do res some testing or something. With, those with respect to six months, is there anything magical about that? Because my my thought with six months was if we're doing a moratorium, I'd want to keep it on the short side, just not to not to hurt anyone. Well, it won't change him right now at all. He's already existing, but in right. six months we can have this discussion again and make a decision what we're going to do. And that gives them time to give us input, gives Titusville time to give us input, and gives us time to maybe to get do more research on this is something if we want to go ahead and move forward on. Six months would probably good. Then we're not making emotional decisions. We're not hurting him right now, and you kind of know we're going to be talking about it in six months. But and we can do some testing out there as well. I can make okay. that a separate motion when this is over, if you'd like. But I'll, my second will stand on that. Okay. Okay. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Second motion. And then with respect to the second motion, and if you'd like me to modify this, Virginia, just let me know, and I'll, I'll tweak it accordingly. Make it but short. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd move to authorize uh, natural resources to test for any uh, contaminants of emergent concern, PFOS, any uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, if you think there's a need to test for anything else, you know, I'd, I'd like this to have some wide latitude, but essentially for those and any other chemical substances that may be of concern. And to begin testing with Mr. Kempfer's permission as soon as possible. All right, Did somebody second? Second. Second by Commissioner Pritchett. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. I think that's the responsible decision. Yeah, I'm in too. It's like four o'clock. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, do you want to make a motion to waive legislative intent on that so that we can so directly moved. that? Okay. So there's a motion on the floor to, wage, or to waive legislative intent and a second by Commissioner Smith. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed unanimously. All right. We uh, have six. As item six. All right, so th I'll, I'll try to keep this as brief as possible. Um, That's impossible, Commissioner Lowe. I know. Lower. Well, I said as, as brief as possible, not brief. Big difference. It's four o'clock, and I'm hungry, and I'm about my brain hurts. To agree to 
Ooh, it's a, it's this is the time to get the motion. It's in. an important issue. I just want to make sure we're we're able to think and discuss it. Well, the, yeah, the short of this, and I, I'm I'm going to try to keep it as short as we can. Um, I spoke with Eddie Fontenin, uh when he was first installed as a department director. Actually, before that, what was it? Back in March, thereabouts, March or April. And I I, I don't want anyone to misperceive my, you know, my. Um, dissatisfaction with the situation to be dissatisfaction with Mr. Fontenot. I'm very happy with the job he's been doing. But I'm aware, we've, we've talked a number of times about the issues with the, uh, the sewage infrastructure. I just was hoping that you could make other folks aware as to what process you're undergoing now to ensure that in the, the coming days here, we will not continue to have sewage leaks like this. If you could kind of give us a little background in terms of what you're testing, why you're testing it, and where the, the areas of, of failure generally are, I'd appreciate it. Okay. Um, well, let me, let me talk about, um, you know, the, the pre, the present, and the post. I don't know. It's been a long day for me, yes, too, sir. so I apologize. So um, recently we had a couple of discharges. We had malfunction reports go out. One was in South Beaches, one was in West Coco. And to give everyone a little understanding of what occurred, um, South Beaches, there was an air relief valve strap that broke off. Unfortunately, the day and time that it broke off was Sunday at 7 a.m. And unfortunately, why I say it's unfortunate is um, that uh, a lot of times when those unfortunate instances occur, they usually get called in. We usually have our field staff out there. And by the time we got out there, um, we were able to recover, but nonetheless, we had a, a breach that we reported. And then in West Coco, um, we had one that occurred at 6 p.m. on a Monday. And again, that was a discharge event. Um, the one in the West Coco, the, um, it wasn't so much a malfunction with regard to our system in terms of a pump failed or anything like that. That was accumulate. That was a uh, talking with our field guys. It was an accumulation of um, a wad of of fat oils grease that was clogging the line, and that resulted in a surcharge. And then again, the unfortunate thing is, it occurred at 6 p.m., which you know our our crews go home at 3:30, and we have sounding alarms and whatnot, but by the time it was mobilized and, and whatnot. So um, that's just to give a little background of what's, what's gained some attention. Um, to give you a little bit about what was going on is, and I always, and I talked about this in the workshop that we did in April, you know, fiscal year 14 was really the pivotal year from the utility. It was the year that the utility got a rate increase in order to deal with a lot of the R&R. &R. And since then, the utilities has done over um, 68 miles of sewer lining. And again, when we talk about discharge events, um, you know, the big culprit, not the only culprit, as I talked about some other instances, but the big culprit is I and I. And I think that's the direction of this. Um, can, you know, can you tell so, folks that aren't familiar with, with what that is, what that is? Yeah, I and I is inflow and infiltration. And, and long of the short is, is that when the water table rises or water penetrates from the ground down um, from the top down through the ground, if there's any kind of, um, if the pipe isn't completely sealed due to the age or the material that was used at the time, groundwater penetrates into, the, um, into our gravity sewer and it takes up the capacity that really should have been allocated for wastewater. And as a result, what happens is that, um, you know, in severe events, and we look at Irma, and we look at Hurricane Matthew, when we get a, a, um, a lot of rainfall, is it exceeds the capacity of our pumping capacity, and it requires us to make a really a, a tough decision because as flow is coming in, we either make the decision of saying we're going to stop pumping and let everyone's house upstream flood or have that discharge go through their house, or we have to do a discharge event. And unfortunately, that's, um, we make the decision to, um, you know, to discharge, obviously, because, um, you know, nobody wants to have sewage come through their house. Um, but what we're doing with regard to that is, um, and again, I, I, I like to reference the workshop that we did in April, 
we're, we've already completed the sewer assessment, the gravity sewer assessment for all of the beaches. And for our jurisdiction, it's all of the collection system from Panita to the south. That's 103 miles of sewer assessment. And the reason why we're doing sewer assessment is we're trying to take a more um, precise um, approach to what we need to spend our dollar resources in fixing. So, you know, I, I used the number 103 miles was assessed. If I would have asked, and I've done this, I've asked our field guys at the beginning of this assessment, because there's always pessimism whenever you introduce something new. And I asked them at the beginning of this, of that 103 miles, what percentage do you think we're going to need the sewer line? My crews were saying, and the, you know, these are guys out in the field, based on age and what we know, you know, 50, 60 percent. After looking at our assessment, our first need is around 13 percent. So we're looking at something we were going to spend about $20 million that right now we're going to be investing 1.4. So I think right there it shows the success of what we're trying to do with, with the definition of assessment. And I, use, and I say that because sometimes people ask the question, well, how, what do you need to do to fix it? Well, in order to really answer that, you really need to assess everything. And because as I said, if you were to ask me in March, how much do you need, I would have said $20 million, you know? But now I'm able to say it's 1.4 and why, that's beneficial is it gives us um, it gives us that latitude to work within our budget without asking for rate increase and I'm not saying a rate increase isn't going to be necessary at some point in the future but as a director I'm really trying to make this work as best as we can um, you know we talked about um, and I just wanted to kind of give you some highlights too we talked about um, the smoke testing, and I know we've done two phases over in Satellite Beach, and I know we, uh, and you know, the by percentage, I think uh, the total number of homes that were impacted by smoke testing, and I'm going off of vagueness, was something like 10,000 homes of that area. And I know there was some logistical, um, if, if someone's identified as having a, uh, a breach in their lateral, a lateral is viewed as private property, what mechanism can we do in order to essentially force that homeowner and taking the responsibility of their house? No different than if you didn't cut your grass, what's, you know, what's the measures? Um, and, and recently, we, you know, we've been working with the county attorney's office and we've looked in our current codes, both in utility and, and um, building, and we do believe that there's also language in there where we may be able, um, and it looks promising to do that, to do the enforcement as a code enforcement. So what does that mean? So it, it gives us, um, if, that, if that can happen, now that's more encouraging that as if we do more smoke testing, which I encourage, um, it gives us a mechanism to not just identify what's wrong, but to also for that homeowner to take the measures in order to do so. Um, I'm sorry. I have more if you'd like to hear. No, no, please. Christine, I know you told me to keep it short. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, to, uh, you know, I use the word assessment, and in, uh, in real quick uh, numbers, in order to do smoke testing, gravity assessment, and manhole inspection, and keep in mind, our utility district has 13,000 manholes. In order to do an assessment of all of that, we're looking at a number of just under $4 million, which for $4 million can be assessed, and it allows us to come back and let you know exactly what our needs are based on that assessment. Um, you know, in addition to, uh, you know, we talk about the due diligence of assessment or not, but we, you know, the, we have current projects going on. Um, to name a few, we're in the 90% of the MECO force main, which again is an I and I categorized project, an extension. West Coco, we've, um, we have an $11 million extension. Soon to go out to bid is the Riverside force main. We're in the near completion of the South Central wastewater plant expansion. And that alone is about $70 million. That is currently active. 
of, of, of being implemented. In addition to that, we've already, um, our staff and I have already got in with some of our consultants to look at some of the discharge events. And we, you know, we talk about, um, you know, a lot of the, um, you know, negative publicity is about the discharge event that occurred during Irma. And so in looking at the two discharge events, the one in Satellite Beach and the one in Melbourne Beach, you know, we have strategized with some of our consultants and we're in the study phase right now, but again, both of them seem to be promising on coming up with a long-term solution to, I don't want to use the word eliminate, but greatly reduce the probability of an occurrence. Um, and again, we're looking at those two projects alone, if they come to fruition, is about $15 million investment. So, you know, in addition to that, um, you know, we're probably, I would like to say, at the 90th percentile of drafting a fat, fats, oils, grease program. I emphasize the fats, oils, grease because, you know, we focus so much about um, I and I, but a lot of it also has to do with capacity of the pipe. If restaurants are allowed to dump fats, oils, grease down, um, down the line, it obviously, you know, blocks it up and as a result of what occurred in West Coco. Um, and again, you know, fats, oils, grease is really designed around or, um, restaurants and um, food processing facilities. Um, so, you know, now you got to take it a step further where you get into public education because the person who's doing the deep fry on Sunday at his house is if he's dumping it or she dumping it down the drain is obviously going to have the same effect. So we're really... Um, you know, I'm trying to say this in short, and I'm open to any question. Um, you know, prior to me coming here, the utilities was a, was active in in addressing I and I, and you know the you know the 15, 16 million dollar investment over three years of sewer lining is really a testament because um, I don't think a lot of utilities can make that um, statement. And what we've done is we've continued that program and just added on and ratcheted up. And recently we're looking at even accelerating some of that, which is some of the numbers I shared on how we want to also pursue more assessment. No, I, I appreciate that. I think, you know, just to touch on a couple of things that you mentioned, uh, I've also spoken with the county attorney specifically about the, um, the smoke testing and the laterals. And one of the things, I, I don't know what the current numbers are, maybe Virginia would, would um, recall them better than I, but one of the things that, that kind of struck me as almost indefensible is that the folks whose laterals were leaking, who were notified that their laterals were leaking at the last round, and were, who were offered to go select the plumber of their choice to replace it and be reimbursed for it, the vast majority, the overwhelming vast majority, didn't. And to me, with the issues that we have with the lines, there's no excuse for that. And I've, I've communicated to County Legal that if, if uh, they would be kind enough to help me put together something, essentially having some onerous penalty for the folks that are in that situation where they're essentially ruining our system because we can't handle the volume, even though uh, we otherwise would be under capacity, based upon issues on their end when we're offering to pay for it and have them use the plumber of their choice. If they choose not to do that, then they really should be hit with a penalty. And I, I don't care if it's 100 bucks a day or whatever, whatever we're, we're lawfully entitled to hit them with, because that's having an impact that's causing us to have discharges. As far as fats, oils, and grease, you know, you certainly have my support when that comes back before the commission. But if there's any, any equivocation or any question at all, or if you don't think the penalty is onerous enough as far as code enforcement is concerned with folks that have the leaky laterals, let me know. I'm happy to make it a D2 item and, and put some new code in place. Uh, to make that very clear uh, that we're just not going to tolerate it any longer. I think that we've got enough problems and enough costs with our own system that to have folks who are irresponsible and their irresponsibility is causing us to have these issues is, is really not okay. Um, if there are any programs that, that you think need to be put in place or we'd benefit immensely from putting in place in the near term out of that $4 million to assess, whether it's to do half or all of the manhole inspections, which I, I believe you mentioned would top out at, what, 200 a manhole? Roughly to inspect at 150, yeah, 200. 150 to 200, yes. So worst case, if there are certain areas where it just hasn't been serviced in so long or inspected in so long that you have reason to believe, whether it's in D1, D2, or D5, you know, let me know and I'll, I'll put it on as a D2 item and, and try to get you funding. I don't care where in the county it is. I think we just we need to stop worrying so much about uh, you know assessing 
whether it's a municipality or a county, if we're having these problems all over the place, obviously with the manholes, that's a county issue. Mm -hmm. But if there's if there's any area where we provide uh, service for municipality, I don't know if that's the case. You know, let me know where the greatest concern is, and I, I'd like to focus our resources on that because we, we're just in a situation where. When I have constituents reach out and say they're upset with the situation, I understand it's not your fault. You've not been in that position for you know for even six months at this point. I've not been in for a year at this point. These are decades of of, uh, of issues in the making, but it still doesn't make it acceptable. The county still has failed these folks, despite it not being your fault by any stretch. And we, we need to extricate ourselves from the situation we're in. So if there are any resources the board can give you, whether it's monetary or otherwise, I mean, there's there's a reason that the state revolving fund is, is half a percent APR, as mm -hmm. I recall. I mean, it's it's essentially as close to free money as we'll ever get. Mm -hmm. uh, and if, if we need to spend some reserves in fixing the system, that's the reason we have reserves. So whether it's a combination of borrowing or increasing rates or going to reserves, we, we cannot continue to have these issues. So whatever we can do or I can do, to, to push any of these initiatives forward, you know, let me know because I'm just tired of seeing the leaks. Commissioner Pritchett. Thank you, Madam Chair. When I um, had an opportunity to talk to you yesterday, thank you for all you're doing. Oh, I, you're I think welcome. you're just a champion in this department. You said you were working on a plan that you would have some information about two to three months. And we, we also discussed, um, because we, we talked about these rates, and I gave these to you guys again. Just taking a median amount, what Brevard pays difference, and I didn't even do water, we're just talking sewer, between Brevard and maybe the next, the, the median, let's move up to Cocoa and Titusville, and you were joking around saying you want it barefoot bays. But that's a 20% difference in what we charge in the unincorporated as far as the incorporated. And when you go to stormwater, it's a 30% difference. So I think we do need to make these adjustments. Let me tell you why. Because I think he's going to come back with a good plan, and I think this is the appropriate way to fund it because the people using the system should be paying for it. Just like if you're eating lunch at Chick-fil-A, you shouldn't be paying for McDonald's person buying their lunch. You pay for your lunch at Chick-fil-A. I'm kind of hungry right now. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so I think this is just the, the right thing to do. You know, Titusville, Palm Bay certainly stepped up. Everybody stepped up their rates to try to do these projects. So, and I don't want to cripple you because you're doing this work. And I, I don't think you'll probably have to go up to the full amount, but I, I think this is something you should know that I'm in favor of because I think it's the right thing to do because we should all be paying for our own services. And it's an enterprise fund. You know, it's like a separate business. It's a Chick-fil-A of the county. You know, other mm. thing we can do is sell it and let somebody run it independently. So I, I'm, I'm going to be in support of this when you, you come back with your findings. And if anything you can accelerate to the front, let's say we have to borrow it from another place in the county and we pay it back with the rates or however we do it, I'm in. So okay. if we can get this going and get it started, it's a lot better than paying fines to the state. On, I'd rather just get ahead of it than, than, than to have to have that problem and utilize our funds. And can you, dis yeah. can you just touch on the stuff that we take care of for other municipalities as, a, as the, for like the, the county? Yeah. Because we, I think, you know, people think county is just unincorporated. No, so we, uh, like I said, so our, uh, our area, our, our service boundary is we do water and sewer in the MIMS area. We do sewer in Port St. John. We do sewer in Merritt Island. Um, we do... And again, there, there's some reuse in there, but uh, for wastewater, wastewater, our jurisdiction on the beaches is everything south of Panita. Um, we also do Barefoot Bay, and then we have um, what we call South Central, which is Vieira, Suntry, Palm Shores, that area. Okay. Because I think, you know, people don't realize just how big we are. I mean, how far extended we are throughout the entire county. It's a, it's a, I mean, it's, uh, it's a lot, and it's spread out over 70 miles north and south, so yes. Right. That's a lot. And I, I just want to put out there as well, just so there's no surprise down the road in, in terms of where I'm at with rate increases. Um, I agree. I, I think if you're eating at Chick-fil-A, you need to pay for what you've eaten at Chick-fil-A, but you shouldn't pay for the guy that came six years before you at Chick-fil-A. So I, I think there is a happy medium somewhere with that. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe it's not the cleanest analogy at 4.15 4 from a 9 a.m. meeting. But, hungry. you know, I, I think that we have so many years of, of uh, lack of, of appropriate work done on, on keeping these lines intact and, and in good repair. For someone like me that moved into the county, you know, less than 10 years ago, 
I don't know that it's fair that I should, or I'll give you a better example, someone that moved here last week, that we should burden them just because they happen to be ratepayers by having them catch up for, for years and years um, of rates that may well have been lower than they should have been. So I'm, I'm not opposed to looking at raising them, but I, I think really what we need to do before we, we go anywhere in that direction is determine once we have the system working properly, what is the cost to maintain it appropriately? You know, these things may have a, a 15, 20, 30 year lifespan for the different components. Over that span, anticipating that we have a normal amount of things fail or we replace them at a normal interval so that hopefully they don't fail even better, what would it cost us? And I think to get over that initial hump, you know, that's where I, I have a little hesitation or a lot of hesitation to be a little more accurate by, by going just solely with a rate increase. I'm not opposed to increasing rates if the rates aren't sufficient to maintain the system, but I, I don't like the idea of funding all of the fixes right at the out front solely out of rates. So I, I may meet you somewhere with that, but I don't know that I'm gonna go all the way to, to where you necessarily may be comfortable with, but I'm not, you know, I'm not going to draw a line in the sand and say, no, I'm not going to increase rates. If they're, not, if they're not able to sustain the system, then they may have to go up. But, you know, I, I just, you know, I'd hope that everyone keeps an open mind, and I'm, I'm willing to keep an open mind on raising them to a degree, and, you know, hopefully we can, we can look at a way that, that doesn't ruin everyone or, or deplete reserves to zero or cause us to borrow 100 percent of it. Commissioner Pritchett. Yeah, no, I think on that, Commissioner Lober. Right now, if you live in Brevard County, you pay forty four fifty eight a month for sewer. If you live in Cocoa, you pay 53.56. You live in Titusville, you pay 53.57. So even that Delta, if they catch up what all the other surrounding areas are paying, I think that's even going to be more than he's going to need because I'm not. Gonna, I can't imagine he's 20 to 20 percent influx. But not only that, this shows why we've probably gotten so far behind. We haven't kept up, and Commissioner Isnardi um, had mentioned this at a meeting before. You know, we're kind of paying for past commissions, right. not doing what they should do. And I mean, I guess there was a big problem that went on and we talked about that serving before and, and going through the economic crisis, but I don't know why everybody can't at least catch up to regular rates. I think it's just appropriate because everybody else is doing that. Not only are they taking care of their stuff, they're also doing more INI or they're doing more areas. And you know what else this would do too? We can increase capacity, which is a problem. Yeah. So I, I think it's definitely something, you know, we need to look at and see what numbers you come back with because I think there are new plants that need to be built. But I think it's the business of sewer, and people using the sewer should pay for the business of what they're doing. I mean, if, if this was Walmart, you know, they're not going to say, well, we're not going to have our customers pay more for this for, because we charged too little before. No, they have to keep up with their profit ratio. And again, we don't do profits here. Good thing for the citizens. But what we do have to do, we have to be reasonable of collect enough money coming in to pay for the costs going out because if you don't who's going to pay for it somebody's got to pay for it it's got to get done what's well, going to fall on the backs of all the county and the people are already paying those rates in the other areas which is the other 48 percent so i don't think it's fair to maybe necessarily add an extra tax to the whole people when it should just be the 42 percent when they could at least catch up with what everybody else is is paying but again i don't think it's going to end up having to go there but, you know, I'm, I'm curious to see where it is. But I am excited for Brevard County to be the leader in taking care of this problem and this situation. And I'm hoping in the next couple of years we will have no more leaks, no more problems, and we'll be saying we, we stepped up to bat and we, we fixed our problem. And I would be very proud of that. Commissioner Smith? Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate something that I've said before. The thing to keep in mind about spending lagoon funds on sewer upgrades is the fact that every dollar you spend on a sewer upgrade is a dollar you take away from the lagoon fund. And if you take a dollar away from the lagoon fund, that's a finite source that's going to end. Where the people that get the sewer should be spending the money, they should, their rates should reflect the money necessary to maintain the sewers. And so that's where the responsibility lays. People that live in unincorporated areas of Brevard County that don't have sewer you're asking them to give up their restoration money to fix somebody else's sewer. Man. So that's something else to consider. And, and we've had this argument before, but I have a hard time, you know, and I don't know, I don't really want to get in the mud with this again, but my argument will always be, how do you keep people's faith in the way that you're repairing the lagoon if you're dumping a bunch of crap into it? So well, and, we, have and, to, and, we have to do whatever we can to stop it. And, and if the utility... I think we have to do both. Right. And if the utility doesn't have enough money through rate raises, and, a, and I'm not even opposed to, to having a fair rate, 
you know, increase if it's fair across the board, but it may be a combination of both. Absolutely. Because there is zero, zero chance that people will have faith in what we're doing and believe in our cause and believe in our projects and, and want to, you know, champion the tax and, and feel like we're doing the, the equitable and fair thing with the lagoon and have confidence that we're making the right choices if we're dumping raw sewage into the lagoon. Because Eddie has given us some great info, and we are spending $100 million of the lagoon fund on infrastructure and sewer upgrades, so I think right. we're doing all those things. So but maybe the short-term fix is finding a way to handle the capacity until we can repair all of those pipes and repair everything. So when we do have an overage, we've got a place to store it. I know that sounds ridiculous, but if that's a couple million bucks that's going to save us in the long run, and it may be something we can convert later, or use later in these extreme circumstances to where we're not discharging. That's one you know? of the ideas we're kicking around. And, and it sounds like really simple, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, when you think about it. <laughs> right. But it's so, it's so impactful. You know, yes. We don't want to undo all the, everything that we're doing now. And, and there's no way to measure how, just how bad it is because how treated is it? Has it gone through the system? Has it, you know, some of it been filtered? And, talk about biosolids. Yeah. Right. Talk about biosolids, right? <laughs> my, how many my days have we been here? My last okay, thought on this over. is, you know, and this, this comes up with different items on this. Yeah, tr I hope so. But, you know, this is one of those things where if we continue to worry about, you know, who, who checked the box last time and what's fair this time, that's not what people want. They want the issues fixed. They want the leaks to stop. They want the lagoon to be better. You know, I, I don't live in an area that's on sewer, so if, if the county subsidizes, if you want to view it that way, the folks that are ratepayers, I'm subsidizing the ratepayers to a degree. And I, I can tell you that my property taxes are not the lowest in Brevard County. I'm not trying to be a jerk about it. But my point is I wouldn't do something that would indirectly or directly cost myself unless I thought it was truly the best way to go about it. Now, I, I think this has already been said by at least a couple of the other commissioners. I, I don't think the answer is purely rate increases or purely pilfering money from any particular source, whether we're borrowing it from, from a department or eating up reserves or going to the state revolving fund or going to the, the Sorrel funds. I, I don't think that we have to say, okay, well, we're going to go this one route and that's the only way that we're going to fund this. I think we can get flexible with it, stop worrying so much about, well, is this fair or that's fair, and just say, how do we fix the problem? What's the most efficient way to get it done that's not going to bleed any one source dry? And I, I'm flexible with it. I just hope other fo folks I will be I think we're all on the same page, yeah. are we not? Yeah, I, I think so, yes. and I hope so. Commissioner Pritchett? Just accept that I'm an accountant, and there's a color of money in different pots you can pull it from. So, and, and as a CPA, I'm very protective of those numbers. So we can probably come to something that will work. I'll, I'll bring my crayons to color it otherwise. I would appreciate that, <laughs> sir. So um, that's, that's just a little bit of, of my hesitation with, with that. But I do think this needs to be a priority to fund and get fixed. And I also do think there's a possibility, even if there's surplus money sitting around the Lagoon Fund, you borrow it, and then you pay it back out of the rates over the 10 years and get it all accelerated and up front. So there's, there's some creative things we can do. But I absolutely agree that this needs to be on the top and we need to get him funded to be able to fix these items. So Eddie, I guess that you know, I, don't, I don't think there's any vote needed, but please just let us know. Yeah. I, I don't want the finances to be an issue for you in terms of what gets done with this. If you need money, tell us what you need and we'll do everything within our power to make it happen. And if, if you identify a need tomorrow, put it on for the next agenda. And, and if you can get something done very quickly and it costs a little bit more, that's okay too because it still beats putting the crap in the lagoon. Yeah, and, and, you know, there's, so, you know, we're, as we're sitting here talking about rates, we're, we're engaging and issuing a, PA, a PO for a rate consultant to look at our financial dynamics. Because, again, if we, um, or we if, I, if I come before you and ask for a rate increase, I'm, I have no doubt you're going to ask, well, how did you come up with that number? And I think that's the due diligence. Do we have somebody we used before so we don't have to yes. go out to RFP again? Yes. Because that's like yes. three more months. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's okay. that's already being handled. Um, the, you know, and we talked about the assessment. And, uh, you know, and again, this isn't going to be like blocking it. But what's promising about the assessment is, is, you know, I, you know, as I said before, if I asked on beaches before this, I would have asked $20 million. Now that we've done the assessment, I'm asking two which is fantastic. And I'm not saying that percentage is always going to carry forward, but that's the benefit of getting an assessment done. And that's, 
And, and that's, the, um, when I talked about accelerating, that's gonna be one of the components we're accelerating. And, uh, but in a, because this is all related to dollars, as we're, as we're talking about rates and another exercise we're doing, we're also looking at not only what we need to fix, but you know, what are opportunities in the county that we need to expand our water and sewer? Because then the question becomes, um, you know, today's, today's Greenland is tomorrow's development. You know, if, I mean, I've, I've lived in Vieira for 13 years and from when I moved here to today, it's, I can't believe it. You know, they're, all, they're almost ready to touch Panita. And if you think about it, when I first got here, it was nothing. I didn't even call it farmland. It was just trees and bushes. Um, so when we look at those trees and bushes today, we have to look and see if that's where we need to plan for utilities because, you know, the, the rule that was always taught to me from other utility directors that I've been associated with, utilities has to be three, four years ahead of the curve. If, if we are, if we're responding to the, to development coming, we'll be turning back development because we can't keep pace. Um, Vieira can build much faster than we can build a wastewater plant, which is the reason why we're doing what we're doing. Um, so we're, we're actually going through a due diligence to find out where some of those pockets are, and those will be incorporated, and it'll get shared. Great. I have some cards. And then I'm going to turn everybody's mic off so nobody talks anymore. I'm just kidding. I'm just joking. No, you can't. <laughs> no that was a joke, okay? Yeah. They, just here just here. making making it light. I know uh, there's there's Florida today. Oh, that is nardy. Okay. <laughs> Sandra Sullivan, and then after Sandra, I don't know if Courtney left or not. Yeah, it's, it's Rita's fault. Yeah. Sandra Sullivan, Oops. Oops. You know, in my little garden bubble, and got active, because to me it's despicable to be dumping sewage into our Indian River Lagoon, it's like being a third world country. But I, you know, I know the I and I is a big issue, especially beachside. A lot of the issues beachside are issues. Um, and it seems to be in that area more that is an issue. So I just wanted to say a couple things here. Um, so I think we should increase the taxes, but I, we, we, from the engineering society, they, are, they, they made an estimate that Brevard is looking at four to five billion dollars to bring our infrastructure up to date. And I think you need to look at the big picture and in order to, to look at what you need to do to plan. And it's, it's great to hear that you've started with an assessment. Um, okay, so, um, so, the, so we have heavy rains, we have discharges. Um, I, the wording of the half cent sales tax was the 302.9 million 10 year plan for restoring the lagoon within Brevard County includes such thing as muck removal stormwater projects, upgrades to wastewater treatment facilities, septic system removal, blah, 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 blah. That's the, what the people voted on. They voted on it because they were tired of the degradation of the lagoon and they knew that the infrastructure was part of the problem. That is the people's will. And that, and, and it, was, it was exceedingly offensive to me the first time when I woke up and I went, let me read the lagoon plan. And the big elephant in the room was there was no mention whatsoever of infrastructure in that plan. And, and so I think the people's voices are speaking more and more loudly on this issue. And I think you have to look at a multifaceted way of paying for this, one being rate taxes, two being the lagoon. And I have a proposal for you. And that is you take that, that lagoon tax is bringing in way more money than what anybody expected, $150 million last year. Take the excess tax and apply that to infrastructure. How can anybody argue? It's more money than what anybody expected to have in the first place. It's free money, like, you know, in a sense. So that would be my suggestion. Um, okay, so um, the, the, the bottom line issue is there's also um, advocating to the state level because the EPA allows 90 dumping days uh, per uh, per year, and our sewage plants are running at near or at capacity. 
um, we need to uh, address those. Those are going to take a lot of money um, to be, you know, Merritt Island, I I'm down to five seconds. So uh, please continue with the impact study and extend the sewage into the other areas for the beaches because it's not just sewage, it's sewage, water, et cetera, et cetera. We need a full impact study, Thank please. You. Thanks. Pamela White? She's gone. Oh, she left? Robert Burns? Robert Burns, Vieira. I think we should have a Chick-fil-A employee on every advisory board. I'm just yes. saying. I think we should have Chick-fil-A in the back. <laughs> in the back. <laughs> and, yeah. Um, real quick, from, I, I wasn't sure what this item was going to be about specifically, but after hearing everything, um, I'm glad I was here. Uh, from, from the numbers that were given, or I wasn't sure if the numbers were given for the number of lateral lines that we have that are leaking that are causing a problem um, that uh, people are just refusing to fix, and the, uh, I'm, I was glad to hear that code enforcement may be an a option to try to get people, encourage them to do that. Um, I, I think that's something we can do for some other issues with the lagoon as well, but I, I'm, I'm curious, is another alternative that we could uh, explore, and before the sale of a home, if someone would spend 10 grand to upgrade their kitchen to make it more sellable or attractive, I don't know the right word, it's late. Um, can we enforce that if there is a lateral line issue that the house won't pass inspection or it's revealed at least in the inspection that the, um, before they sell that house or property that that has to be addressed? I think that will have a significant impact on the overall issue, that's all. That's good. That's all the cards I have, I kind of like that idea. Maybe it's part of the home inspection. If we're hitting them 100 bucks a day, any which no, way it may. No, but if they don't, if it's not, a, if it's just something that's it? been inspected because it, we're not going to inspect every line in the county, but if it's part of the home oh, inspection. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Maybe when the, the title I changes. I think the idea would work when you do smoke testing if your house is identified as having a, uh, and, and I think the ordinance is gas tight, water tight, which if obviously if you have smoke going through the ground up to the surface, that would breach that. Um, then but you're that, not doing it every week. So no. if someone sells their house five years later and it's just not. Yeah, rich, I, I think the cycle needs to be when smoke testing is occurring, then you have the proof in lieu of, because otherwise you're going to, I don't know, we can work out the logistics on that. I think that the quickest possible way is hitting, hitting folks with a daily fine, a recurring daily fine until they get it done. Mm -hmm. That's just the folks we're going to be yeah. identifying when we do the smoke test. But if you're talking like at the sale of a home as part I, of the inspection, is that re even reasonable? I like, just don't is know what it, it costs. Yeah, I mean that's that would be the only downfall. Would be really expensive to. Well, not to mention if you, uh, so let's say you owned a house today and you knew it wasn't working correctly, but you didn't sell it till 20 years from now. That's 20 years you're actually compounding the issue. Our our goal is. Yeah. Our goal is once we do a due diligence to say that you do have a fault in your line, that's when you know that's that's when the code enforcement yeah. procedure would kick in. I think I was thinking more in addition to, but all right, thank you. And you, Saint, for staying here this long. We should have moved you up, quite honestly, but I didn't know if the, it was going to be a long discussion. I'm going to really push them to go for the, the initiative here since you waited. You've almost earned it. A long, point. long time. Thank you. And I apologize for the confusion in the notes I brought. This is item seven. The wrong Adam. notes. So um, uh, my name's Miriam Moore. I'm with the Brevard Homeless Coalition. I live in Coco. Um, I would like to um, emphasize that we don't like to focus on homelessness. We like to focus on solutions. And so we look at ways where we can improve the lives of people as we try to um, offer them housing interventions. The, um, other than our lack of affordable housing in Brevard County, one of the largest barriers that our citizens experiencing homelessness have is transportation. They don't have it. It's hard to keep job if you don't have transportation. It's hard to get access to services. What we would like to do is request a credit of sorts uh, and work with um, Space Coast Area Transit. Uh, we would like to uh, have up to 60 
discounted rate, limited use, 10 pass bus passes, or 10 use bus passes per month. Uh, and that would be an up to amount. That wouldn't be a definitive amount. It would likely be less than that. But these passes would be used to help the citizens that we're actively working with on housing interventions, ones that have been identified through our chat process. And they are working with case managers, with community specialists to get into housing. It wouldn't be everybody. If, if I don't want that to be um, a confusion, it would not be every person that we're working with. So it, it would be a limited amount. Right now we work with a bucket system, so we might have you know, 20, 30, 40 people at a time that we're working with, but it wouldn't be the 815 people that we had in our uh, point in time count this year. I appreciate your, your sticking sure. around, Dr. Moore, but uh, I'm gonna go ahead and move to approve the agenda item. Um, with with one notation, mm -hmm. it's specific to to this proposal. You know, I don't want to set precedent for anyone else expecting that they're going to get the same sort of thing. I think you're uniquely situated in what your organization does, uh, and I think this is something where, at a minimal cost to the county, we can really help you potentially. So, you know, with that said, I'm going to move to approve it. I have a motion by Commissioner Lober. Commissioner Pritchett. Yes, ma'am. I think this is such a good cause. I love what you guys are doing. My struggle is is that we had the CBO funds and we all made that very painful decision to start moving them to a different arena. So I think what this needs to do is maybe submit to those funds. I think it's still got another year or two. Um, just because Commissioner has already brought up a good point that we're all picking our winners and losers that way. And this is a worthy thing but there's a lot of others too so i don't know how to just differentiate it when we all come with our our one so anyways if we move this to the cbo and we go ahead and run it through there and it gets funding that way i would be good with it but i mean it was a very painful process we went through three or four years ago on on having to make some decisions with children's organizations mm -hmm. and all types of things um, so I, I would be willing to make that move and, and, and see how it falls in, in line with that. But that's what we did a few years ago. And it wasn't easy, but this is one of those organizations, Commissioner Lober, and it was very difficult to, to do. But it, was, it just seemed to be the will of what everybody had wanted at that time, unless we start picking them up again and we have reason to. But I, I think that this is getting it as an outliner of those things that we worked. That we had to do. Tobiah? Thank you, Madam Chair, and I agree with each and every word Commissioner Pritchett said. May I, may I say something? When we're done, okay, and then sorry. if they have a question for you. Commissioner Smith? Yeah, I would like to say I, I, I love your idea. It's a noble cause, but there's a but. There are so many organizations in this county that have, could make the same claim and stand there and say the very same thing. And as my, as my understanding is, we already give discounts to, is that not correct, Scott? Don't we do discounts on different groups? Well, uh, we sell uh, passes and tickets to different um, social service agencies, some that are working with homeless as well. But uh, the, we estimate from our last calculations that the cost of a regular ride is $3.32. So when we charge a dollar fifty or reduce fare seventy five cents, or even less reduce fare uh, for a ten ride pass, ten ride punch card six dollars, um, that's that really doesn't come close to covering the actual cost of the ride. So yes, it's discounted. So that's the dilemma because all these other organizations that are paying sixty cents for a three dollar and fifty cent trip, they're paying. So now they're all going to be here in one free passes too. So you can see the logistics of it make it very, very difficult. It's, it's a hard position for us to be in because I think every one of us would like to help. Mr. Lover? And a, a couple thoughts and then I'll, I'll invite you to, to jump in if you'd like. You know, my understanding is we have discounted passes for seniors, disabled folks, students and veterans, but I don't know that we have any for folks that are homeless or am I mistaken? We do not have any f uh, for people that are homeless, that is not a category in, so that, the, in the fair policy, you're right. And that's, that's something we may want to look at separately even from this perhaps or with this to expand that because if we're giving these other groups discounts, which they certainly have a good basis to get, I think that you know, the folks that truly need it the most as well 
um, we ought to look at that. Now, with the CBOs, I, I agree, the CBO policy in terms of phasing that out is a smart idea. I agree with that 100%, but we're not talking about literally handing money away. We're talking about um, bus passes. Now, I understand there's a cost that's associated with that, but you know, at, at a minimum, I would suggest that we at least extend that discounted rate to this organization so they're not paying full fare for folks that are homeless, because I, I don't think that's fair either. Uh, and I don't know that the, the concerns over precedent would apply. Um, other than that, you know, I'd certainly in, invite Dr. Moore to speak, and then hopefully if, if she's um, amenable, she'll discuss the, the donation box idea as well. Yeah. The, um, the difference between the provider agencies uh, pur purchasing the passes and the coalition pur purchasing the patch passes is that all the providers are part of the coalition. So this is specifically for our chat process. It is only the people who have been offered housing interventions. We lose a lot of people because they can't get transportation to where they need to meet with the case managers and they can't get services at the portals during that time when we're offering these interventions. So the only agencies that are actually able to get these discounted passes are the ones that work with veterans. We can't help the families with children, and we have a lot of families with children in the woods. We're giving them tents every week. Um, we have, we have uh, a lot of senior citizens right now that are experiencing homelessness because of the rates that have gone up. And uh, these, these are people, uh, and a great deal of them, have not been out a long time. So when we offer them a housing intervention, if they can't get to our case manager or they can't get to the service portal, we lose them in the system. It's, and, it, and it's, we do appreciate the, the, the CBO funds that are still being given to, to some of the provider agencies, but this is for the coalition as a whole. This is where they offer the wraparound services, and it's where all the agencies come together and work with the most difficult cases to get them housed. Commissioner Pritchett, is that new? No. I was just gonna recommend then that we go ahead and roll this to the CBO and then they can come back with some, some idea on funding, because that's the appropriate place for this to go. So it, it, it could go through. I don't, I don't know. I'm going to have to have them look at the budget. But there is a budgeted amount for that already. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I would agree, like, in the future. But, like, right now, if we're offering those discounted rates for the disabled, the veterans, and the seniors, if this is something similar. Because in reality, if this was all coming out of our general fund, then we could argue that, you know, you're a service provider or you're an agency that is a conglomeration of service providers that help house people, which I which I don't think anybody would argue is a basic but human we need. We don't house the co Well, you don't. For yeah. our homeless co and we aren't funded by the right. county or by any other entity well, what I'm other saying, than what I'm saying state is and federal that, grant funding. What I'm saying is that the, our SCAD or transportation system receives state funding. I mean, we get grant funds and there's money that comes from the state that helps us pay for transportation. And given that, and I've always been a big advocate for public transportation, given that, you know, most people that ride the bus are riding it to work or mm -hmm. riding it not, not for leisure and recreation, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have an issue at all with a discounted rate, but it doesn't look like you have the support for that up here. Well, let me, so, well I would support that. Let me, let me do this. I'm going to go ahead and withdraw the old motion. I'm well, gonna, Commissioner Smith sorry. said he would support it. Yeah, but the old motion I'm going to withdraw. I'm going to make a new motion that's more in line with that. And I would move that we add a new category of discount fare along the lines of senior, disabled, student, and veteran for either homeless or for, oh, Mr. Bate? If I can. The current uh, reason we have this, the, 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 uh, the categories that we have, uh, there's some federal guidelines and requirements that apply, and it's by board resolution. So in, in making the motion you're making, if you ask us to modify the current resolution to add a homeless category um, for the coalition and we will work to revise that resolution so you could get that discounted rate there if that's what you're that's looking for. <laughs> because there's no money exchanging hands if you're just right. getting it for a discounted rate. So, yeah, that's okay, my that's motion. motion. Yeah. Okay, we have second. Commissioner Pritchett, second by Commissioner Smith. Quick question, do we give discounts for people low income? No. So, you know, guys, we're opening up a whole other caveat because caveat, there's people low income that are going to need help, too. I mean, if we're going to do this, we should just make a 60 cent per bus ride and then eat it as a county because that's basically what we're doing because we're already so far under cost. Again, not that I don't love your project, 
but I, I mean, how, how do we just chip out one, one category? Because there's, there's people that hardly make any money and they're still pulling out their funds to ride the bus. And, you know, these, I see these guys in our neighborhood all the time. They, they go to work and, and they come back and they're, they're paying. I, I don't know, guys. I, maybe um, a little more time to think about it again. But I, I think this belongs under the CBO funds because this is a CBO cause. And again, if you guys want to look at that later and make changes to it, but I think that this is the, the correct path of where this needs to go. And then um, it can get funded through that. And then this probably, you know, maybe a discussion later what we're doing with CBO, but this is definitely a CBO project. Because I'm just telling you, there's low income families and there's going to be people that have, um, you know, short term problems where they're having, I, I don't know. I, I don't even know what the statistics are on that. And, um, it's, it's definitely a worthy cause, but someone's going to pay for this. And, you know, somebody has to pay for it. You know, I might cut it back. There's two, pot, there's two ways to earn a, a net income with revenues and cost. You either increase your revenues or you decrease your cost. Well, as you keep increasing your cost, you, you lower this part, and it's going to dip into it to where you have a deficit, and someone's going to have to pay for that somewhere. Ergo, it's going to have to come out of the general fund somewhere, guys. So if that's what you want to do, but that's the real discussion. But I really think this is going to have to belong in the CBO right now because it seems to be where it goes and then maybe down the road. Well, we you're also going to have other organizations like the one I can think of right off the top of my head is Promise of Brevard. They're all worthy. That's what they do. Yeah. They, they work with homeless families. And so they're going to become seeing us too. And I, and I love our bus system. We probably part of the coalition, right? The, well, yeah. this this was only proposed for the people who are literally homeless. That were we not people in transitional housing, not people in programs already that are being assisted. No, but I'm just saying, Promise of Brevard will be here asking for the same thing because they take in homeless families. So maybe we if, need to if they're in transitional housing, the though, this, it everyone. wouldn't apply. We're, we're only asking for assistance with a few people that we serve each month in the chat process that are literally CBO. homeless. Commissioner Tobias. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, th I think there's a motion and a second. My question before I vote on it is how would we, I, I know how we identify someone based on age. I know how we identify someone based on um, a veteran status. How, how would we identify someone uh, based on lack of housing they would come from them yeah we have a we have a process that identifies people and and um, uh, basically assesses them it but, wouldn't be but, anybody but, just walking off the street yeah, but saying, my, yeah. homeless yeah but my question would be, do you provide a card to these people well that was actually one of the suggestions in the proposal is that they are they are eligible based on our ability to confirm that we're working with them and they are homeless and that the oversight would be with the Space Coast Area Transit. So it would only be for those people. And yeah, it would that, be an ID card with an identification on it that was issued. So they couldn't just hand this to somebody else. It's limited use, no more than 10 times in a month. No, I, I think yeah. I, I th yeah. I'm, I'm just counting. But I think the, the, the free passes oh. know, left the window. Um, but I think the motion on the floor was an extra discounted category. rate category. Mm -hmm. And my question is, how would we identify someone being homeless should we? Um, extend that discount well you would suggest or I'm sorry uh, Commissioner Pritchett had also mentioned low income we could always have uh, people can be verified low income by you know what they make um, so I mean that wouldn't be too difficult they so may they not be literally so homeless bring, but so if you're gonna so do they the bring discount, their w2 to the bus driver and say hey I make under eleven hundred dollars a month here's my w2 well what about somebody who's already re receiving benefits that's already been authorized by the the state government that they're low income like a okay. snap card per yeah, se yeah that Have would seen? that snap would say snap, it though unfortunately snap cards don't <laughs> the snap cards we've done away from food stamps snap cards mm -hmm. look like debit cards now they're very difficult to you know I'd identify well, I could definitely get back with you on that. I'd have to think about it, but I'm sure there's a way that it could be identified. Like I said, I didn't come here but planning to talk about everybody. But part of the coalition, don't you guys keep a case management log of, of everybody you're working with to try to get, that you're working with to house? Like, don't, doesn't your coalition of multiple agencies keep that case management log so you know how many people you're working with? Every agency has their own data. Right. We have aggregated data on certain things that we're required to keep by HUD, they mandate that we keep certain data. Um, 
the, uh, the chat process, we do keep track of how many people we're housing through the chat process, and that is the providers that are all working together on those housing interventions. So I could get you that information if you'd like, but that's why I originally requested a very low number because we don't work with a large number of people at one time in that process. Eddie, don't we sell those tickets, the, the, low, the low cost tickets? <coughs> yes, that's what she's asking for uh, to be given. Yeah, 10, they're so a that, punch card. And the reason I ask is because Commissioner Tobias was unsure how your folks would get, you would be buying the tickets. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, yeah, we could we could do it that way, where essentially your organization buys them, and then if you get paid back by the folks that are that are making use of them, then you vet them that way. That's then it takes the burden off us to have to, to go through and look into it. My thing is, is we're already we're even whether it's federally required or not, we're already discounting disabled veterans and seniors. So I mean, denying her, she would have an argument to say, well, why are my homeless folks denied? So I don't have a problem with it because I know the work that you do, and maybe that's because I have that insight and I see how you help families get back on their feet and get housing. But if, it's, if, if the, our agency receives state funding, grant funding to provide public transportation and we can't give you a discounted rate when it's a basic, when it's a basic need yeah. because people, that's just me. But I don't know that you've got the support. We so may. I'm going to call the question because I, I'm question you... okay. One question: Is there money in the CBG funds to go ahead and fund this? CBO. I'm sorry, CBO. CBO. Getting all the G's and D's. Uh, I, I believe the board, um, when Mr. When uh, Ian came, uh, he brought back the last funding, yeah. and we established it for the next two-year period That's that right. we were just going to be drawing down with the agencies from what the board had uh, approved the last okay. time when it came to you. Okay. I might vote this through today, but I would ask that next budget it goes into that and that, that we, that's part of the consideration. Um, but this is a, dis a discount. And, you know, I'm just, you know, if we're going to do this, we might want to consider, you know, countywide low income and then find a way to supplement. Jim, you're waving at me. Yeah. Hi. Chick-fil-A, right? Sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> if you let me, Commissioner, sorry. A long time. Um, a low income, I don't know too many transit systems that do it. I just read that Seattle's looking into reduced fare or fares based on low income. It, it's not that easy of a process. You know, what is low income? Well, what you know, would be what if we just discounted, discounted the whole county? county. Well, if we just yeah. did the whole county for discount rate and we... Well, you could, um, you could uh, that's up to you guys. You can reduce okay. the fare, you can raise the fare however you want. Maybe that's something um, we can kick around because I think mostly... Yeah. Well, I can't um, make that generalization. There, there will be effect. Um, though when I was looking at the numbers, they're drawing about a million dollars in fares. So, oh. you know, there is elasticity. So if you Ouch. drop it by half, it doesn't mean they're going to lose half their money, but they could lose three, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000. But it's sort of like health care. It's like a service provider. Your Medicare patients and your paid mediocre, your Medicaid patients don't pay anything, and your private health yeah. insurance makes up the difference. So I'm not yeah. saying it's right, yeah. but I'm saying, you know, the, um, the, the transit agency, um, they have reduced fare cards, ID cards, and you know, the first thing you do on that is you identify somebody, I think our age is 60, and then you stop. You don't, then you don't have to worry about income, you don't have to worry about veterans, disabled, and anything. You go with the, you go with the easiest stuff to verify first, yeah. then you work your way down the list. If it was low income, we'd have to develop some kind of standards, bring it part of the pack of the fair resolution, gotcha. and then develop a way where the people can come in and show their low income. So there'll be, there'll be some paperwork, then you issue them the ID card that allows them to show the bus driver or they can buy the passes. Okay. In terms of the homeless, uh, off the top of my head, probably the best way is to work with certain agencies than they say, Jim is homeless from now until June 30th, okay. and that ID card's only good for that if they're paying for themselves or you sell the passes to the agencies. Well, this That's is kind of off the top of my this head. This is good. Only thing is, I've met with you and I've met with five other people that reach out to homeless organizations. So I don't know if this is about to get multiplied by five or six now, also. So just, mm -hmm. just with you guys, I mean, um, great work, by the way, and I really like you. But, you know, you got George Taylor. I got a guy in Palm Bay that calls me every day now that's doing something. I have a lady that's starting one in Titusville. She's got a great big organization going. So, I mean, these are a lot of organizations. Mm -hmm. 
So, uh, you guys, I don't know if we do this. How are we going <coughs> to tell the other five or six no if they come in with the same request? Just a thought. Um, so, if we if we don't move it on their CBG, it's, it's at least it's some kind of application thing. I I don't know. This this is what I'm struggling with. It's good, but it's breaking every policy we have set up for the last three or four years with with um, I almost you know wish Mr. Lover would just write you a check for it right now. <laughs> And this wouldn't even be a county well, issue. I know he's a rich guy. <laughs> and I personally don't have. I don't have a problem extending this discount yeah. to to people trying to, you know, transition from homeless to. So you would be fine if all the others came in and did it too, then. Well, George Taylor is probably the only other he's truly probably, organized person that does it. I've got a couple other that came vets. and met with me like she did. And they're organized. But Palm but Bay, he's, that, he's the one guy. He's yeah. the one guy that you've met with him that, too. That well, that's tried to but, work. With this I was going to say, Brevard Homeless has Coalition has is the continuum of care for homeless yeah. and homeless prevention in And how many Brevard agencies County. are part of the Brevard Homeless Coalition? At least 70. Yeah. So they're, they're And they have a board. Situated. They're all volunteer. Nobody's paid. Nobody gets a paycheck or a salary. I, I do. I have one employee. That's it. We, we right. operate on a small staffing grant from yeah, the state of Florida. You, no, all no the funding that, that comes through the coalition is distributed sure. to the agencies to provide services in the community. The coalition itself is not funded. Sure. Right. So that's why, because this is a project of the coalition, yeah. that's why we were just asking for that small credit, not even cash in hand, it's, because it's even if it's on only you. 10 I'm people in a month. I'm probably going to vote this through. I am tired. I probably would mm. like a little more time to, <laughs> to kick it around, because I like everything being in its little box, and this isn't. So it's, it's a little bit of a um, struggle for me when the next guy comes in. I, I think someone's going to make me eat it. But um, eat it, I might. But okay, thank you. All right, I'm going to call a question. So nobody has to talk anymore. <laughs> we can just I've make got a another decision. question for her uh, after. No, <laughs> not after, not until Danish we box. vote, and then you've got like a minute, and then we've got to go. I don't need that long. Okay, can we vote on it? Please. What are we voting on? Voting on allowing the discounted rate. Right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Four one. All right, can you give us a 30 second recap yeah, on, uh, so. on the did donation we have a box? On that motion? Okay, we did. I this is to. actually just a, a suggestion at this point. I haven't uh, successfully contacted. And this is another big issue, and I, and I know you've been here the whole day. Yeah. And this is Commissioner Lober's item. So if you want everybody to really look at this <laughs> and, and do it with an open mind and do you everything. you want me to come back and? I would, okay. only because I don't know I'm that sorry. you'll get the support. That's all right. But, you know, and then I promise you because of this and, and how important it is and, and mm -hmm. the fact that you are like a multi-agency organization, I'll move you to the front of the agenda if okay. I'm still chair when you come back, which I'm sure <laughs> I should be unless I'm, they kick me out. Thank you. Yeah. I no, we don't do it. time certain. Commissioner Smith, that's, <laughs> that's, that's a bad word because my office gets lots of calls for time certain. And I told the sheriff no, so I have to tell everybody no. <laughs> Because everybody wants to move stuff around and then nobody knows when their items are going to be read. I think I've asked awful. once ever. Once, maybe twice. But when once it started to get out of hand is when I stopped it. But I'll move you up so you're not stuck sitting. Thank you. I, I just want people it. to give it <laughs> adequate time and consideration. Mm -hmm. and, I don't, and I don't want us to go, oh, this is too much to handle. So is that okay? Yeah. And I can okay work on you? this and send additional information before I come back. Yes. All right. Just, awesome. If you keep with me, I'll keep it on the agenda too. Thank you so much, all Thank of you. you. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks so much. Bye. All right. Public comments. Grover Gregory. That's the most patient man in the room besides <laughs> yeah. the doctor. I've been here all day too. And I saw the sign where you're asking for blood. It was right there on the men's room <laughs> door. And uh, I just want to point out, I do pay taxes and now, now blood. Um, I'm here to save you some money. I see that we have been uh, struggling with a lot of these expenditures. Some of them don't look like a whole lot of money to me, but I don't know all the facts. Um, I live on Rockledge Drive, and uh, there's a beautiful section of that drive where you have a canopy of trees, and everybody loves it. I really love it, uh, not as a pedestrian or a biker, but because my house fronts that. Uh, these trees have provided me with protection from hurricanes. Um, they cool the temperature down tremendously. 
Uh, and um, in my mind, anyway, if you're driving northbound on uh, Rockledge Drive there, you're very, very attentive to the road um, because of the trees, because there's trees around there you can hit. If you get inattentive for a second, you can easily hit a tree. I think that's great because the other thing you could easily hit is a pedestrian or a biker. Um, we have recently seen, uh, there's been a mix up and we didn't get to come in and, um, and you know, pile on and, and give our personal opinions of this, but the six or 700 people uh, kicked into a petition, said, please don't cut these trees. Uh, we have some, uh, the only notification we've got and, and some PowerPoints and stuff uh, are saying that pretty much all the trees are going to get cut uh, because they want to go to the edge of the road and then go straight up 14 feet. That pretty well takes them out. So no more canopy on that section. Uh, for me as a homeowner, you know, this is like taking my property, uh, taking value out of the property. Um, and for the community, I mean, everybody was gushing about this, this section of drive. So I don't know what it costs to trim and or cut. And I know we had a, some disagreement. It's not clear to us what gets cut and what gets trimmed. But if we look at the 14 feet from the edge of the road, it's pretty much all the trees get cut. Um, because they all lean over. Uh, so in the opinion of myself and all the residents, I haven't found any that disagree, uh, we would prefer to see signage, uh, maybe more prominent signs that warn people to pay attention uh, to where they're driving, uh, to, um, you know, slow down, to, it'd be nice if they didn't drink or smoke uh, while they're driving, but... Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons for people to run into trees, and there's zero reasons for trees to run into people. So we're trying to protect the trees because once they're down, they're down. They've been there. It takes 100 years to grow a live oak to the size of these trees. It is gorgeous there. Sorry? I agree with you. It is gorgeous there now. Yeah, and we just don't want to see that destroyed. So there was a mix-up. Okay, we I have know to that... move on. I'm so sorry. If, okay. But if I let you talk, I have to let okay. everybody talk. Okay. Thanks. Michelle Mar Marisic? Michelle, okay. And Robert Burns. We joke about the long meetings and stuff, but we're used to it, so. No, not this late. Robert Burns, Vieira. Uh, I forgot. I'm saying I like it. I was trying to be quick, and the last time I forgot to ask a question or make a comment on the uh, utilities. The director's gone now, but I was going to. I don't know who the PR person is for the county, but. Um, it sounds to me like we're doing a lot. I'm not, I'm not sure what else we can do, but the perception and some of the rhetoric out there, especially from the media and, and social media, et cetera, is that nobody's doing anything and we're just letting these leaks just happen out of negligence right now as opposed to mistakes in the past. And I, I would love to see not necessarily a PR campaign, but you know, some kind of marketing coming from the county, whether it's from the utilities department or individual commissioner's offices letting everyone know what actually is happening. Maybe not to the detail that he explained it because it's hard to understand all those things, but something quick and easy so that people know that stuff is going on. News releases. Yeah, news release. Um, and I can't remember anything else, but that's all. All right, thanks. Thank you. All right, board reports, Mr. Bate. No report. Ms. Bentley? No report. Commissioner Pritchett? No report. Commissioner Lober? I'll keep this to 45 minutes in the interest of time. <laughs> I'm good. That's not even funny. Not even funny. <laughs> I thought it was pretty good. Commissioner Tobiah? No report. Commissioner Smith? I would like to just take a minute to uh, shout, out the, shout out the Vieira Little League. The Vieira Little League juniors made it all the way to number two in the country. Quite an outstanding feat of timely hitting, slick fielding, and solid pitching. So kudos to the to the boys, men, parents, everybody that participated, because that's a big deal. 
That's awesome. That's great. And I have no report. So seeing no more discussion, I'll adjourn this meeting at 5.03. <laughs>